Today is April 6, 2010, and as part of MIT's sesquicentennial infinite history project, we are talking with Professor Thomas Magnanti. Tom is one of 14 institute professors at MIT and former dean of MIT School of Engineering. He has devoted much of his professional career to education that combines engineering and management, and to teaching and research and applied and theoretical aspects of large-scale optimization. As dean, Tom focused on educational innovation, industrial and international partnerships, technology-based entrepreneurship, and diversity and innovation in emerging domains such as bioengineering, tiny technologies, information engineering, and engineering systems. Professor Magnanti has led several centers and programs at MIT, including as the founding co-director, MIT's Leaders for Manufacturing, and and system design and management programs, and as founding director, the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. He has served as president of three major professional societies and editor of operations research. He also headed one third of the Sloan School of Management for several years. Professor Magnanti has received numerous educational and research awards and honorary degrees and has served on a number of corporate and university boards. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering from Syracuse University and master's degrees in statistics and mathematics as well as a Ph.D. in operations research, all from Stanford University. Professor Magnetti is currently serving as president of the Singapore University of Technology and Design a role he assumed in October of 2009. Tom, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure, Larry. So Tom, can, we please, can you please start by telling us a bit about where you grew up? Yeah, I uh, grew up in uh, upstate New York, Syracuse, New York, uh, in sort of a uh, middle class a neighborhood, middle class family. Uh, uh, I spent much of my youth enjoying sports, playing uh, baseball. Uh, used to used to play baseball from about eight in the morning. I'd get up. I'd be the only kid in my neighborhood uh, up, and I'd just throw the ball up in the air and catch it. And I would play through dinner, uh, come home, have a couple sandwiches, collapse, and start the day over again. That was my my youth, my misguided youth, as they say. And could you tell us a little bit about your family and uh, any significant events or influences? that stand out from your childhood? Well, probably the most significant uh, influence is my father was a, uh, a applied mathematician. And uh, he had these uh, math books that I would look at when I was a kid. And uh, he would also pose math problems for me. So we'd be driving in the car or whatever, and he'd pose math problems. And uh, I guess I took a liking to them and really enjoyed them. Uh, and. Uh, Actually, I was talking to my wife last night, and uh, she said, you know, asked me what I wanted to be when I was 20. I said, I've always wanted to be a professor, even at age 20. She said, no, you couldn't possibly. I said, yeah, that's what I wanted to be. And I think it was from reading those books and, and that interaction with my father. That's great. Yeah, he, he uh, uh, was a uh, math major at Syracuse University and then went to University of Minnesota, where he was a, a, a graduate student. Uh, and then, unfortunately, his mother died, and we all uh, swiftly moved back to Syracuse, so he never actually finished his graduate studies. And did, and also, what, did he teach? Uh, he did a little bit of teaching, but he, uh, most of his time he worked uh, for a company called Salve Process, uh, later became part of the Allied Chemical Corporation. And he did, uh, uh, mostly did cost estimation type of activities. Uh, he actually brought, there's a, a something called uh, uh, critical path method, and he brought the critical path method to bear on the company. But he, he had uh, photographic memory. He uh, uh, just remembered numbers and uh, all the time. Uh, uh, he also, uh, after World War II, when he came back after World War II, uh, made his living for six months playing gin rummy. <laughs> and uh, I think it's reputed that I took my first steps in the, the back room of a pool hall uh, where people were gambling. Uh, and uh, he learned to play gin rummy from someone in the uh, Air Force who I think was the Florida State champ. And uh, by the end of his uh, time in the uh, Air Force, he could uh, 
beat the fellow regularly. And finally, after six months, uh, no one in Syracuse, New York would play him anymore because he was winning all the time. So he had to get a real job. Was that a common, do you think that that com came from a combination of his photographic memory and his mathematical Yes, it is, yeah. I think he brought the two together, yeah. Yeah, he, he would say that he almost never saw, never came across the gin rummy hand that he hadn't seen in some ways before. <laughs> you could have taken that to, uh, to Las Vegas. Well, once when I was a, when I was a, a graduate student at, uh, an undergraduate student at Syracuse University, I had uh, started playing uh, gin rummy and uh, bridge for money and things, and I was doing pretty well. So I thought, you know, I'll challenge the old man, right? So I came back home and said, all right, I'm ready for the challenge. And of course, he whipped me. Right? It wasn't even close. <laughs> so, uh, as a as a young boy, uh, did you have any uh, challenges balancing this love of sports and, and uh, you know the love of mathematics and what it took to be uh, a good no, student? No, no, nothing particularly. I, you know, I, I was fortunate that studies came easy to me, right. and uh, so I, you know, I, I can't say I spent all that much time on my studies. I spent most of it on sports, actually. Was there an aha moment when you realized you had a Special aptitude in the sciences. No, no, no aha moment. Right. I think I it always it's uh, been pretty good at math type of things. Uh, I did have an English teacher who used to berate me because uh, I would spend all my time on uh, my math stuff, and she didn't think I was taking English seriously enough. Uh, but no, I did have. I had a, a one. I had some very good teachers, and I had one particularly good uh, chemistry teacher as an undergraduate, uh, as a, uh, yeah, as a uh, high, in high school. And uh, I would say that he had some influence on me in terms of just, uh, you know, people who were really great at, at, in the classroom teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So was that when you first developed or uh, got interested in science and engineering? Uh, no, I think it actually just it came from these, uh, these reading, looking at my father's books. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just sort of reading them and uh, sort of getting intrigued by the puzzles that he would pose to me. Uh, right. And uh, then I decided to go to, to undergraduate school uh, in chemical engineering, uh, and uh, it was a very small department, only 12 of us. Uh, How did you decide on chemical engineering? Well, my father, again, worked for a chemical company, oh. so all of his friends were uh, chemists. He was an applied mathematician. All his friends were chemists. So I, when I said, what did I know? I was a young kid. So I'll go study chemical engineering. Uh, I was in a very small department. Only 12 of us graduated uh, that year in our department. And I think I was, um, I think I had maybe the number three grade point average from the university, which was pretty unheard of for, for someone in engineering. But the number one was one of the other 12. <laughs> so I, I wasn't even the best of the 12 <laughs> in, the, in the chemical engineering graduating class. So when was it apparent to you that you were going to be going to Syracuse? Uh, well, uh, I actually commuted, and uh, I think it was just growing up, that was sort of the natural place to go, right? And, you know, right. Kind of coming from this middle class family, we didn't have lots of resources. Uh, it was the local university. My father had gone there. He graduated from Syracuse right. University as well, yeah. So I, I don't think it was much of a conscious decision. I think I had, I may have had an offer from Cornell, uh, but I, I it was uh, going to stay pretty local. And, and uh, I would say in those days, uh, people didn't, travel quite as much as they do today in terms of thinking about going any place in the country to school. At least for my neighborhood, people didn't travel, that's for sure. But then your uh, horizons broadened significantly when you uh, ended up at, at Stanford for yes. your master's yeah. degree. Can yeah. you tell us how that came about? Well, I, I, uh, I can't say that uh, chemical engineering ever excited me all that much. Uh, I, I sort of liked uh, some of the sort of math sides of it, but the chemistry part uh, didn't send me all that much. And when I was, uh, I think I might have been a junior in, uh, at Syracuse, uh, one of my professors gave me, uh, it was a reading course, a book to read. And it was on uh, something called linear programming, which is sort of the core area of operations research. And uh, this was great, because uh, I didn't have to uh, do anything in the laboratory. I could just uh, think about mathematics and use it. It seemed to be interesting problems that were people were addressing. So I decided, well, maybe that's it for me. So then when I applied to graduate school, I applied to uh, one chemie department, uh, University of Delaware, which had a, a group that did uh, quite a bit of math type stuff for chemie. And I applied to a couple of uh, operations research departments. But the, f there was a fellow at Stanford who was actually in chemical engineering who was well known for applying these kind of methodologies in the chemical, chemical engineering fields. So I thought, well, maybe I'll go there 
and ended up uh, uh, studying with him. And it turns out I went there, and there's a fellow named George Danzig, who was sort of viewed as probably the, the greatest operations researcher ever, uh, the father of linear programming, uh, National Medal of Science or National Medal of Technology winner, uh, that brand, that that uh, caliber of person, and he had been he was moving from Berkeley to Stanford, and uh, he came I think the year before I did, and so it was an opportunity to go and uh, you know work with the very best. Mm -hmm. Did you know when you were going out to Stanford that you were going to be pursuing a, a PhD in operations research? Yes, yes. Oh, you did. Yes. So that was a that was the plan, right? From that the was beginning. the plan. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and then, so tell me, uh, how did you come to get two master's degrees, one in mathematics and one in statistics? Well, Stanford has, an, uh, un, unlike uh, MIT, uh, Stanford requires no thesis for master's degrees. And if you just took enough courses in, uh, that were related to statistics, they automatically gave you a degree, uh, master's degree. So the master's degree in statistics was basically a set of courses on my way to my PhD. But I really love mathematics. And uh, so I started taking extra math courses and uh, decided, well, while I'm doing this, um, I might as well get a degree in mathematics as well. So I just sort of built up enough course credits to, t to get a master's in math. Then when I finished, I thought, well, this is, this is the best life in the world. I mean, being a graduate student and studying and learning, getting up every day and just going to learn. So, so I um, thought, well, maybe I should go get a second PhD. And I was thinking of go going, actually get a, getting one in mathematics. And my wife, who had been working and uh, helping me uh, to support me through school, said, well, you know, maybe it's time to get a, get a job, guy. <laughs> maybe it's time to get a job. <laughs> so, but you knew that, uh, well, you, you knew from a young age you wanted to be a professor. That's correct, So yes. then you pursued that plan, and you, you, re you re earned a Ph.D. in operations research. Yes. And then what were the next steps after that? With your wife's encouragement, you went out looking for a job. Well, I didn't go looking. Uh, people, uh, there were people coming to uh, uh, Stanford to interview. And actually, a, a faculty member here by the name of Jerry Shapiro, who was sort of the senior OR. He and John Little were the senior OR people uh, at MIT. He was out there interviewing. And the Stanford faculty were kind enough to say, you should really talk to this guy, Magnanti. So he came and talked to me, and uh, I said, well, you know, I'm really thinking maybe of doing a postdoc, and I, I really wanted to go to IBM for a postdoc. And uh, my thesis advisor was, uh, I think there was only one postdoc in this field uh, at the time uh, in IBM, and he was trying to work the system at IBM to get me this postdoc. And, and then I had another fellow at University of Wisconsin who was uh, on me for a postdoc. He would call 11 p.m. every night to talk to me, right, because he's really anxious for me to come. And I really wanted to do one of these postdocs. Uh, but, uh, and so, I mean, this is unimaginable now. So I wasn't doing for jobs at all. But uh, this fellow from MIT had come, and uh, he said, come on back east and spend a couple days with us in an interview. So I come back and I interview. And uh, basically that night, uh, over drinks, he basically said, we're going to offer you a job. Again, unheard of. You would just never do that today. And so I went back to Stanford, and uh, I, you know, I really wanted one of these postdocs. And so I, I was talking to the um, head of the department at that time, and he said to me, are you crazy? He says, MIT is offering you a full-time position to go on the faculty, and you want to go off to one of these postdocs. So I guess I thought about this for a while, and I accepted the job. No, did uh, surprise Stanford didn't make a counter offer? Were they looking to keep you there? And no, I, I actually don't think Stanford was looking that year. Okay. Uh, Cornell was looking, MIT was a two or three places, uh, and as I said, uh, I just sort of stumbled into this job. Now, what were your impressions of uh, well, MIT? Be growing up in Syracuse, was was uh, was MIT on the radar screen, or what? What, what were your thoughts about it growing uh, up in upstate New York? That's a good question. I, you know, I, I don't think I had uh, this uh, particular uh, strong image of MIT at the time. You know, I, I, I knew uh, the OR field from my studies, and MIT at that time and still to this time had an interdepartmental OR program. It uh, drawed on resources from around the institute, but it had no department. Mm -hmm. And I was more inclined for departments. So I, it's quite possible if Cornell had made me an offer, I might have gone to the Cornell de department. So I was really focused on OR, I would say, not necessarily on uh, engineering per se. 
And of course, when I came to MIT, I came to the Sloan School. So this was sort of an odd thing as well. I, I, my thesis at uh, Stanford was in a very, very abstract uh, area of mathematics, something called matroids, which uh, was just math for math's sake. It had no application. Uh, and here was a management school hiring someone. This and uh, mm -hmm. one of the faculty colleagues used to call me Mr. Matroids when I came to the faculty. Uh, and again, these days it would be very difficult, I think, for someone to join any business school with uh, such a background. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a very different time. And MIT uh, has uh, <coughs> your department head at Stanford to thank for uh, for you coming here. Uh, yeah, in some measure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, that's well, true. Well, no, that's uh, yes, to some measure. In terms yeah. of, in terms of that advice, in terms of that, right, exactly. it, was, it was it was remarkably sage advice. That's for sure. Yeah. So, uh, so what were your first impressions uh, uh, coming to MIT? Uh, the the students, uh, the culture, the environment. Well, one of my first early impressions was uh, I was here. Uh, I think my f uh, family had not arrived yet, and uh, it was about eleven o'clock on an evening night, and I was uh, walking d uh, down Mass Ave. And I'd just come from Stanford. First of all, I was from Syracuse, New York, you know, a rather small city, and then gone to Stanford, the farm, which is pretty quiet at night. Uh, and here I was, 11 o'clock at night, with cars bustling and people walking around. I said, boy, this is a really different environment. So it was really a different environment in that sense. Uh, and uh, it was pretty exciting. Uh, I mean, I think as it always is for young people. So I you know, go into the classroom and have a sense that, you know, everyone in there is going to be a genius, right? And here I'm going to be standing in front of all these geniuses. What am I going to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so MIT could be pretty inhibiting, I think, uh, at that time. And these were the days when um, you know, people had slide rules, mm -hmm. uh, the very limited computing power. Uh, so it was a very different time in that sense. But, you know, it was extraordinarily exciting to come to the place. Right. And then, in terms of in terms of the culture, uh, in terms of what you had been accustomed to at Stanford, and now you're interacting with students. You didn't yes. come here as a student, but you yeah. came here as a faculty member. Right, right. What did you think of, uh, in terms of whatever stereotypes you had um, in advance, or whatever preconceived notions you had about MIT? Yeah. Well, the uh, what I've always said is one of the big transitions that students make is you go to the other side of the desk, right? So you, instead of being sitting in front of the professor, you're on the other side of the desk. Um, no, the, uh, my first year here was very quiet. I, I just recall sort of sitting in my office, doing my work. No one bothered me. I didn't bother anybody. But also, uh, uh, I've always viewed MIT as a, a very, very, very friendly place but not necessarily a very social place in the sense of, and, and uh, I think it's gotten more social over the years. Mm -hmm. But sort of people left you alone, let you do your work. And I was uh, the only, I think the only junior faculty member hired that year. You uh, were also in very that area. young. And you I was, yeah, I was quite young, yeah, yeah. So I just, uh, I just sat in my office, did my work, taught my courses, probably didn't interact with much of anybody. And then it was my second year where I started, I think, get a little bit more rhythm of interacting with the community uh, more. Uh, right. and. Uh, in those early years, I spent a lot, a lot of time with the students, a lot of time with them, which was, it, it was about as much fun as you can imagine. Yeah. And of course, uh, my first student was, uh, first of all, the students, some of the students were older than I was, and many of them looked older than I was. I actually looked very young at that time. I had these early pictures of my hair down to my, uh, to my shoulder. You know, there was this hippie coming from the West Coast to join the faculty. Uh, and my first graduate student ever was Gabriel Beatran who uh, later became uh, deputy dean at the Sloan School, a uh, very prominent uh, uh, academic uh, academician himself. And he, I think he was, uh, I think he's about three or four months older than I am, or a few months older than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, uh, I was very, very young looking, uh, interacting with people that were, you know, basically the graduate students my age, so many of them a little bit older. So it was, a, it was uh, you have a sort of bit of different interactions with folks at that point in your life. Did you, was there, how, what was the balance like between teaching and deciding to do your research and thinking toward publishing? What was that like early on? Yeah, uh, one is we, we did more teaching back then. And uh, uh, I, I recall my, uh, at least my second year at MIT taught four courses, uh, which uh, is pretty significant mm -hmm. by MIT standards, certainly these days. Um, 
No, I, I uh, had a, little, a lot of time for research, an awful lot of time for research. Of course, th you know, this was also a, a time of great personal growth, right? So I had a young family, I had a young son, young wife. Uh, we were living in an apartment. Uh, you know, just it was, uh, I think we tend to forget at least the old codgers such as myself now, how much, uh, how exhilarating it can be to be a young faculty member and how much time the young faculty people have, right? And they have all this enormous amount of time on their hands. So I had plenty of time to do uh, all kinds of research, plenty of time to do my courses. Did you like teaching? Yeah, very much so. Loved it. Just loved it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this was the reason to come to a university, right? It was to, to do teaching, do research, mm -hmm. interact with students, fellow faculty. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and explain to me, if you would, uh, a, a little bit of, uh, of about each. And one, operations research. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that field and yeah, what, what yeah. that's about? Yeah. Uh, operations research was actually born at MIT. Uh, so a, a very distinguished physicist by the name of Phil Morris, Philip Morris, as view, viewed uh, frequently as the father of operations research in the United States. Uh, and this came out of uh, efforts that he was doing uh, during the war, Second World War, where uh, many physicists at the time, I think some chemists, uh, were brought to Washington to help with the war effort. And they were doing things like optimal deployment of radar, uh, optimal deployment of other uh, military resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this became, uh, the, the, the title became Operations Research, was the notion you were do, you're researching and operations, right? operations in terms of getting things done. Uh, so, uh, I, and, and that field uh, has several different branches. Uh, much of it is to try to uh, do planning, so to bring uh, analysis, mathematics, modeling to plan. So if you're a manufacturer, how do you plan for the flow of goods and materials through a manufacturing facility? Uh, if you're a telecommunication company, how do you design the telecommunication network? How do you route messages in the telecommunication network? And so part of the field looks at um, uh, underlying uncertainty, and so you've got variations in, the, in those operations. Uh, the field called queuing theory, how queues develop and build up. Our dear friend Dick Larson is an expert in that field. Uh, and so that's one branch. And another significant branch is optimization. So how do you uh, develop uh, approaches to uh, better organize a distribution system, to better organize a procurement system, better organize a telecommunication system? Uh, and that's what I fell in love with, this, this field of optimization. Uh, and uh, so it's developing mathematical tools, algorithms, methodologies, uh, models for looking at uh, various operations and how to improve them. Can you describe an optimization problem or challenge that, that impacts our daily lives? Oh, yeah, yeah. well, for... I'm just, yeah, I'm just as an example. Of one. As an example, if, exactly. if uh, you go in your... I don't know if your car has a GPS system in it, right? You go in your car in your GPS system and you say, I want to go home. You push the button from wherever you are to go home, right? Okay. And what does it immediately do? It immediately goes to an algorithm that computes the shortest path to get you from, from uh, home from where you are to home, right? right? And so that's an algorithm. An algorithm says, given the travel times and the various uh, streets that I might go over, right, what's the best path for me to take through this system? So it's actually solving an optimization problem to optimizing that. So every time you press your GPS system, it's doing that. Every time you pick up your phone and make a phone call, the system has to determine what's the best way to route the message through the, the telecommunication system. When you click on your internet, it's doing the same thing. And those are all uh, optimization problems or, or planning problems in which you're trying to use technology for best purposes in those cases. So sometimes people say uh, operations research isn't about uh, creating technologies, it's creating the best way to use those technologies. Interesting. No, yeah. I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but this is just yeah. a, but I know that you were involved in developing systems that uh, uh, assisted uh, Singapore ports in terms yes. of, mm -hmm. can you talk a little, is that a larger scale? I mean, that's a, can you talk a little bit about the work that was done um, to assist with that problem? Yeah, well, that, isn't, that isn't, actually isn't work that I've done, but, uh, but uh, it's, that, that's, uh, those type of issues are operations research okay. issues. So right. you've got all these uh, ships coming into port. Right. You have to take the containers off all these ships. 
you've got to determine what order to take the containers, where to put them, how to place them, so that when you take the, the when you're going to remove them and move to another port, what's the best way to access them? What's the best way to move them around in the ports? And so you can develop procedures or methods for doing that. What's the best place to place the container? If you've got to load a container, what's the best way to load them? A famous problem in the operations research literature is called the packing problem. So I've got a, a container. So think of you're moving your household goods, right? And you've got this limited tra trailer that you've rented, and you want to pack as many of your goods in as possible so you don't have to make too many trips for this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an optimization problem, right? It's called a packing problem. So that's an example of this. And so if you're just packing containers, that would be a, a problem in operations research. Right. And now another area of your, um, another area of expertise is management science. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it's often management science is, used, is synonymous with operations research. So it's, uh, and people view of it management science in, in various ways. But one uh, sort of definition of management science is a, taking science and applying it to management. So it's applying analytic methods, mathematics, modeling, these type of things to management. And so in that sense, there's not much difference in operations research, though operations research doesn't always apply just to management issues. It might apply to engineering issues or other issues. Uh, but then there's some folks who would say that management science is actually broader than that, that it would include information systems, uh, not just operations research. It would include marketing. Uh, so if you look at the Sloan School, the Sloan School's composition of management science uh, has something called, has operations research, something called operations management, uh, marketing, uh, are all part information technology are all part of of management science and when actually when I headed up the management science group at Sloan it also also included the accounting group so mm -hmm. it was part of the management sciences. So you you are considered a pioneer in the field of education by your efforts to combine engineering with management. Uh, why was this kind of change so necessary? Well, I think histor historically uh, there was this divide between uh, those who created the technology and those who managed the technologies. And uh, historically, engineers and engineering educators didn't talk to management educators. Uh, and just as you find stovepiping in industry, you find stovepiping at universities. Mm -hmm. Uh, MIT had, was a little bit of an exception to that in the sense that there was uh, more fluid boundaries between the schools. Uh, and in fact, when I first came to uh, MIT, uh, the Sloan School was a very, very techy place. Uh, and it's hard for people to, to really uh, comprehend this now, but the basic um, information technology course at the Sloan School at that time uh, actually taught something called machine language. Right? So this was the language for, as you well know, the underlying bit language, right, or, or well, close to the bit language, right, for programming computers. Mm -hmm. uh, in my own field of operations research, it actually taught the mathematical algorithms uh, for solving some of these planning problems. Uh, and so it uh, always has been a very techy place. Of course, Sloan grew out of the engineering school here at MIT. Uh, but even then, um, oh, I think historically, even Sloan and engineering were quite separate at MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd find some people that would cross the boundaries. Uh, sort of early on, I would say the operations research people crossed the boundaries between Sloan and engineering, and the economics faculty crossed the boundaries between Sloan and economics at MIT. So you saw these, these boundaries. Um, I think then as we uh, sort of ad uh, address, try to address some, some important societal issues, and uh, I mean, the first one of those I was involved with, and probably to this, this day, one of the most significant uh, collaborative initiatives between Sloan and Engineering and several now management engineering schools was our Leaders for Manufacturing program. Mm -hmm. And this was born out of the, uh, the crisis in the mid-80s. Uh, in the mid-80s, for those that remember, uh, the U.S. was losing its manufacturing base. Uh, there was a sense that uh, the Japanese had taken over manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, they had adopted quality principles and just-in-time principles and other principles. And uh, we were losing jobs in the United States. We were losing market share in, in many of our most important industries. Uh, our balance of payments was getting out of whack. Uh, and there was a sort of a, a, a general fear that, that the U.S. had lost its way in terms of manufacturing. Uh, and I would say MIT to its credit, and I would uh, credit in particular Jerry Wilson, who was the dean of engineering at that time. Uh, and I think uh, Jerry 
uh, because of his personal uh, interest in this and his personal commitment to it, but also I think he was being pressed by some people from the outside that said, um, you know, this is an important issue. Uh, the country is in some problems and troubles, uh, and you're the leading engineering school in the world. Uh, perhaps you should be doing something about this. And Jerry, to his credit, stood up and said, yes, uh, we are part of the problem. That is, uh, MIT's part of the problem, engineering's part of the problem. So he started some conversations, and um, he uh, actually started the conversations with uh, Kent Bowen, who at that time was a professor of material science, ceramicist at MIT. Uh, and it, was, it became clear as they started talking to people that uh, this required just not an engineering technology solution, but also a management solution to come to, to grips with this. Mm -hmm. And so he started some conversations with the Sloan School uh, in terms of uh, this. Uh, and I, at that time, was heading up about a third of the Sloan School, the so-called management science area. Uh, and th there were some sort of false starts at this. They would made a proposal to IBM, and IBM chose some universities and not MIT. There was a National Science Foundation uh, uh, Center of Excellence, uh, Centers of Engineering Excellence, and we didn't win one of those. Uh, and uh, these conversations were going on, and it seemed to me that this was pretty important to MIT pretty important to the Sloan School. Uh, and I think they were looking for a contact at, uh, at Sloan. So I said, well, why don't, I've been doing this management science thing for a while now. Why don't I join them in this effort? So I joined them. Uh, and uh, I think that started, I think, much closer. And I had been interacting a fair amount with engineering already through the Operations Research Center. Uh, but that started this, uh, I think, a more deep collaboration between the two schools. Uh, and. Uh, that became a bit of a model for several other universities. So several other universities uh, adapted that model. Uh, and it became, I think, uh, a way of bringing together the best of uh, management education, research, and thinking with engineering education and, and research thinking. And you were a co-founder of the Leaders for That's correct. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Kent Bow and I were the yeah. co-directors co, co as it began, yeah. I'm now, and then, uh, and then, the, then you also co-founded the System Design and Management Program. Yes. How did that grow out of this work? Uh, how were they connected differently? No, no, uh, well, they're clearly related. Uh, so we had developed the, the Leaders for Manufacturing program, and uh, it was a remarkably exciting time. We had uh, leaders from industry working with us, uh, many of the leading manufacturers in the country. So they're VPs for, uh, for manufacturing, sometimes engineering were working with us. Uh, and uh, some of the second level executives were working with us. Uh, and we had developed the program and uh, we had gotten into about the fourth or fifth year for the program. And it struck me that it was uh, moving along quite well. I was actually very proud of it and very proud of what we had done. But, uh, you know, uh, my own sense is every few years it's good to do something different. So I said, well, it's probably best. And I think it's also best that these programs don't become identified with a single person. I think uh, they sh should become institutionalized ret rather than personalized. So I said, well, it's probably best that I move on and do something else mm -hmm. and uh, have someone else take the reins for this program. So th uh, then I, when I stepped aside, um, there had been some interest in developing uh, something in the systems area. Uh, and I'm trying to recall now, I think it might have been, well, Joe Moses was clearly very interested in this. Uh, and so, um, somehow, I, I don't think I can quite, quite recall, but somehow I'd gotten involved yeah. in this uh, as sort of a next thing to do. And um, started conversations again across the schools. And at least the initial notion was this was going to do for engineering what LFM had done for manufacturing, that uh, of uh, bringing engineering uh, management in engineering, engineering to closer together in terms of the engineering product development side of the house rather than the manufacturing side of the house. Though in some sense, LFM had been thought of as a big M manufacturing. It wasn't just the manufacturing shop floor. It was the whole enterprise. So we started to uh, work on that. Uh, and I was working at that point with uh, a handful of faculty. Uh, I think Dick Schmalenzi was involved, Ed Roberts was involved. Earl Merman was sort of the closest contact. Um, and I uh, got held up one day at the Amsterdam airport. There was a, a plane delay or something, and I got held up for seven or eight hours there. 
So I uh, recall at that time writing the original proposal for the SDM program. This was the proposal for the system de design and management program, uh, which seemed to resonate with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, then at that time, um, Earl Merman suggested there's this young faculty member in our department who you might want to get involved with this, and this was Ed Crowley. And so uh, Ed and I met and uh, developed a relationship, and so we started as the, the sort of uh, pioneering or first founding co-directors of that program, the SDM program. And that program is still thriving. Yes, yes. Still, yes. still thriving, yes, yes, yes. 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 Now, and conceptualizing SDM, you did a lot of field research. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the reason for that and the ultimate value of that research? Yeah, the, uh, one of the first things we asked, first of all, we wanted this to meet uh, industrial needs uh, and to be something that was going to be valued by industry. And just like LFM, we wanted to engage industry in helping to frame the, the curriculum, frame the problem with us. So we went to um, uh, some of our colleagues in industry and said, what should we be teaching? Uh, and they, to their credit, said, wrong question, right? The question you should be asking us is, what's the core knowledge that you need for these programs? And then you're the educators. You'll develop a curriculum around that core knowledge. So we uh, then decided to go out and to spend a fair amount of time talking to people from industry. Mm -hmm. We actually did use some tools of design. Uh, Ed Crowley really did this. Uh, so there was something called House of Quality and some other tools. And so Ed tried to take those tools and use them as we were gathering this information from industry. And uh, we used those tools, uh, that methodology, to then develop what was the core knowledge we wanted mm -hmm. and then built upon that the curriculum that we developed. Those were both uh, pretty heady programs to start. LFM, uh, we uh, had, had decided, actually Jerry Wilson had decided, that we weren't going to start the program unless we got sufficient funding from industry. If we we're going to do this, we had to do this well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had been going round and round with s several companies. We had some that had committed, and, uh, but hadn't yet gotten the full funding for this. And it was April in the year that we started, we finally got the funding. And now we had to decide whether we were going to wait a following year, because we were starting in July, or we would start that uh, July. And we decided to go ahead and start that July. So this is, mind you, without a curriculum in place, without the re uh, uh, the, all the faculty quite in place. Um, so we actually took people who had already applied to either uh, engineering or uh, the Sloan School. And we said, if we got a deal for you, you can come to this brand new program that has no curriculum, uh, has no department status, it's this interdisciplinary program, but you'll get a full fellowship, you'll get full tuition, you'll get a stipend from us. Well, that's a great way of jump-starting. It program. was a great way. So, and so we started LFM that way. In SDM, we ran a pilot year. We had a small number of students, and I think it was about eight or ten students, and they actually were taking the courses as we were developing them in the first year. So both of those programs started in this, uh, uh, in sort of this, uh, let's jump in, mm -hmm. let's learn as we do, um, sort of mode of developing the programs. And again, that's part of what made them pretty heady as we were starting, pretty exciting, and pretty challenging as well. And LFM has uh, morphed into something else, correct? Yeah, it, LFM now is called the Leaders for Global Operations. Yeah, right. To me, it'll always be LFM. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've traveled quite a bit uh, in your time at MIT, from Sloan to engineering. Uh, can you speak about the interdisciplinary aspects of MIT? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the great uh, attributes of MIT is its fluidity. I think it. Uh, it very much values interdisciplinary education and research. Uh, it very much supports interdisciplinary uh, education and research. And I think those fluid boundaries are one of the things that makes this a very special place. So even before I uh, had made any of this move to engineering, uh, I had had students through the OR Center uh, that I had supervised in aeronautical engineering and civil engineering. So, uh, and again, uh, that was partly because of the field I was in, but in part because MIT made it easy to do that in terms mm -hmm. of this industry education. And the OR Center, the Operations Research Center, uh, is a rather unusual uh, animal. It is um, it reports through the Vice President of the Research Office. It uh, offers, uh, it really uh, it 
offers its own educational programs. The degrees are actually officially offered by one of the departments because it doesn't offer degrees, but it runs its own educational programs. It admits its own students. It runs its own exams. It uh, uh, it offers its own. It offers courses through the unit, so it does, has no courses and things. So it's uh, it's a very unusual organization in the sense of having students having educational responsibilities, but having no faculty resources, no course resources, very limited financial resources. But in a place like MIT, it works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, maybe it's a little bit mysterious as to how it works or why it works. But I think in part because MIT values those interdisciplinary uh, interactions and uh, supports the interdisciplinary actions. And you were a co-director of the Interdepartmental Operations Research Center. Yes, and yes, for many years. Uh -huh. yeah. In fact, I was, I was co-director of uh, LFM and the OR Center at the same time. And I think I might have also, no, I think it was earlier than that, I was uh, head of the management science area and I was also editor of the major uh, journal in my field. You know, some of us at MIT are a little crazy. <laughs> and in addition to that, you had, you've had visiting science, scientist appointments at both Bell and GT laboratories. Mm -hmm. And been involved with digital, Sabre, Ford Design, and others. Yes. Can you talk about the value of these sorts of associations with industry? And also, what association should academia have with industry? Yeah, I, my, um, my Bell Laboratories was a, a, a summer activity. So I'd been there in the summer and spent a summer there, and, um, actually in a research organization doing research. Uh, GTE Labs was uh, a research project that I'd been involved with with them. Uh, digital, however, and Sabre were quite different. So digital, um, uh, this is uh, actually in the midst of my LFM uh, uh, activities, uh, I decided to, I was going to take a sabbatical, and I spent the first half of that sabbatical in Belgium uh, at a research organization where I'd been earlier in my career. And I uh, decided to spend the second half at uh, digital equipment, so I was in Maynard uh, up in the, uh, the old mill. Uh, and uh, in part, it was I wanted to experience uh, industry firsthand. You know, here I was developing these programs for industry and getting a sense of uh, what goes on. And uh, there was a fellow named Bill Hansen, who was the vice president for manufacturing at Digital uh, at that time. He later became a co director of the LFM program at MIT. Great fellow. And he was kind enough to let me sit in on his staff. So I would uh, just be there as sort of a gadfly, you know flying on the wall, however you want to characterize it. Uh, I would uh, attend some of his meetings. Uh, he would, I'd have an opportunity just to talk to lots of people, just learn a little bit about uh, what life was like uh, in a corporation. Now, I was also writing a book at the time, and uh, unfortunately, because I was writing the book, I was spending probably more of my time writing the book than and, uh, really learning as much as I might have at that point. But that was a, a very worthwhile experience. My time at uh, Sabre was a, a quite a bit different. Uh, this, again, was another uh, sabbatical. And uh, I was spending about a week a month uh, in uh, Dallas. And they had a small research group, about 25 people, that uh, did many of the um, methods and algorithms that the airlines use mm -hmm. for things like revenue planning. So uh, if you're going to uh, sell seats on an airplane. How many seats do you sell at what price? When do you release seats? All these type of things. And they had also done um, routing for the airplanes and scheduling for the airplanes, scheduling for the crews, all those kind of things that they were doing. And so I went down there. Uh, there was another fellow from uh, Georgia Tech who was also similarly doing that. Uh, and it was, uh, in some ways, I mean, there were some very senior people there, but there were some younger people. It was like you have a, a large group of graduate students in some ways, so you, again, got to interact with them. So I got to see, again, some industrial problems through that setting. Uh, but it wasn't quite, it was at a, uh, a small R&D group, uh, so it was a little different than sitting in the manufacturing. But again, opened up my eyes to, uh, to industry and what industry was doing. And for me, it's been very valuable to bringing that back, to sure. back into the classroom and bringing that back into the programs. The GTE one actually uh, developed into, I've had uh, several students since then do internships there. Uh, and they brought back very interesting problems that we've used for theses uh, and uh, developed theses. One, one student came back and uh, had this uh, thought of an idea, something to do. And, uh, my original uh, reaction was, this is too hard. We can't do this problem. Just, it's just too hard. And uh, he persisted, and he actually wrote a thesis on it. We ended up writing several papers in that arena. 
So these, uh, you know, being motivated by and stimulated by industrial problems or real world problems, I think, is again uh, part of the overall gestalt of uh, MIT in terms of its its minds and manners, bringing the world into MIT and MIT into the world. That was I was gonna. That was gonna be my follow up question. Yeah. In terms of your own research, uh, what do you personally think uh, have been the most interesting discoveries that you've made? Oh, interesting discoveries. Um, uh, interesting discoveries. Well, I, you know, I, um, uh, actually, I think the most important thing that I've done uh, is uh, I've written a couple of books. Uh, and uh, one book in particular, a second book, uh, has become sort of the major textbook in that area. Uh, and so the fact that uh, this is working with Jim Orland and our faculty and a, a, another fellow from currently the University of Florida, Ravi Ahuja, uh, it's sort of become the, uh, the standard textbook, uh, graduate textbook in this arena. And uh, it in some ways synthesizes uh, about a 30-year, 40-year literature brings it together in a way that I think uh, uh, makes it uh, comprehensive to everybody. Uh, it's uh, pretty easily accessible. Uh, and uh, that I think that probably book has had the most impact of anything I've done in terms of uh, uh, my research. In terms of my research, you know, I've done some, uh, some various things on theory, uh, some just out and out theory for theory's sake, which is always good fun and uh, hopefully is of some value to something. But much of my research has been motivated by real problems. So I tend to do theory on real problems. And uh, probably the things that might be most known or uh, best known are some things I've done on designing networks. So uh, if, if you're a, a telecom company or if you're a manufacturing company, you have to design a supply chain network. Uh, how do you go about designing the networks? Uh, so for example, in uh, telecommunications, uh, if uh, what, what typically what you want to do is you want to send messages from point A to point B. You're a, tele you're a telecom company. Where do you put the links in in the, in the network? Uh, how do you route over those links? If you're putting in uh, devices such as multiplexers or concentrators, things that take messages and compress them or propagate them, where do you put those devices? And so we've done quite a bit of work on uh, developing methods for doing that. Mm -hmm. Now when you say we, I mean this is work that you've done. This is yeah. we being me and my students. Yeah, yeah my yeah, students and yeah. I. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I done most of my, almost all, you know, almost all of my work has been done collaboratively with my students. Yeah. I mean, I've done a few things, just a very few things with faculty colleagues, uh, but most of it's been with my students. Yeah. Well, my next question was going to be, how do you feel you have changed or impacted the field? And you just did uh, uh, answer that in part. Yeah. But certainly the textbook must be something you're very proud of. That how long has that been? Used and does it continue to be used? And yeah, we, I continue to get these small royalty checks. Right? Uh, yeah, it continues to be used. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's probably now about 15 years old, something of that order. Um, yeah, I think you know the, what. Are, what are we most proud of? I, I often say I'm, I'm most proud of my students. Right? I mean, you, you bring you have these incredible young people that come. And they work with you. Uh, then they go off and do uh, great things for the world, right? And uh, along the way, we influence them some, right? We hopefully help them grow both personally and professionally. Uh, and uh, we have a great time uh, doing research with them. Uh, and I, I seem to have, uh, and maybe it's in my genes, I seem to populate uh, Dean's type of people, right? So yes. I've had a, uh, one of my uh, uh, students, Gabriel Beatran, as I mentioned before, has become the deputy dean at Sloan. Jan Hammond is a senior de uh, uh, deputy dean at uh, Harvard Business School. Uh, I've had uh, one uh, who I think is still an associate dean at the um, University of Texas. One was an associate dean at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I seem to grow these, uh, maybe it's these uh, administrative instincts that I have in some ways, but you know, pollute them, right? That is, that is a great accomplishment. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just step back a little bit and talk about engineering systems again. Yes. In delivering the prestigious Brunel Lecture, you cited the 20 greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. These achievements, these achievements include electrification, transportation, airplanes, water supply and distribution, and electronics. How would you characterize the role of engineering systems in these achievements? And as a follow-up, 
how did MIT contribute to those achievements? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the, again, this was the, um, the National Academy of Engineering at the turn of the century decided to, to uh, identify these 20 greatest achievements of the last century. And uh, it was a very elaborate process. Uh, Chuck Vest, our president at the time, was involved in this process. And the striking thing to me when I looked at that list, and this is what I discussed in the Spurnell Lecture, was um, most of them were large-scale technical systems. I mean, electrification is a system. The highways is a system. The internet is a system. Right? These are all very complicated technical systems. And um, in that sense, uh, they provide great opportunities and great challenges for MIT and other places. Uh, how do you diagnose such a system? How do you design such a system? How do you manage such a system? How do you improve such a system? Now, uh, I wouldn't say that MIT has been involved in the systems aspect of all those. And in fact, those systems evolved over time, often, I would say, in a rather ad hoc fashion. I mean, if you think of electrification, right, uh, you had uh, uh, people like Westinghouse and Edison and others developing you know, uses for this in the systems in terms of, uh, and over time they grew, right? You can say the same thing for the telephone system, right? So Alexander Graham Bell had this idea and eventually the, sort of these systems grew. But they, they didn't grow out of any uh, necessarily planned effort in that, in that sense or planned activity. It was sort of organic, generic growth, if you will. And I think what we try to do through engineering systems, and I think what MIT and other universities are trying to do now is Many of the most challenging problems that face society these days are also engineering systems. Think of the environment, energy. Uh, there's clearly technology components of this, but there's also how those technologies are, are deployed and managed in a system where the system has both technical challenges as well as political and social challenges involved mm -hmm. with them. And that's what MIT is trying to do in this arena of engineering systems is develop the wherewithal for doing that. Now, I tend to view myself is an engineering systems guy in the sense of I look at networks and look at these systems and stuff. But my own work has tended to be sort of the mathematical modeling of these, where I think engineering systems more broadly, would, that would be one component of it. But it would also how you architect those systems, uh, how do you think about the, uh, the political landscape, the social landscape, and the like. So I, I, I wouldn't point to MIT okay. as contributing to the system aspects of those. Uh, though I would point to it now as trying to address those systems and trying to improve them right, in terms of providing the wherewithal to improve them. So, and as a follow-up, what do you see as the big challenges ahead in engineering and management in the 21st century? And what are the opportunities for today's young people in terms of uh, uh, assisting in meeting those challenges? Well, I think the, the major challenges facing society are, are pretty, uh, I think, obvious to all of us, right? So it's healthcare and the healthcare system, it's energy and the environment in, that, in terms of that system. Um, and there's this sort of continuing role of, uh, of technology to improve our lives, aid our lives in a variety of ways. And you know, if you think about where we are today versus where we are 100 years ago, I, I used to use the following little exercise when I gave talks about uh, engineering. Uh, let's go back to those 20 greatest accomplishments of the last century. And let's just suppose it's 1900, so we haven't had any of those yet. And uh, you wake up in the morning, there's no electrification, there's no highway system, there's no telephone, uh, there's no internet, there's no uh, water purification, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's no household appliances, all these great achievements. So we wake up in the morning, uh, we eat our breakfast, we go to work, we come, I tell people close their eyes and imagine this, right? We come back home at night, you know, there's no electricity for reading books and stuff. We get out the candles or the kerosene lamps or whatever it was at that time. Uh, and now, just imagine your life now compared to that, right? And uh, the entire fabric of society in terms of not only our level of comfort, but think of the industries that drive society, think of the political landscape of society, are all driven by those accomplishments of the last century. So in that sense, uh, uh, technology and engineering has had this pro profound, profound influence. And I tend to end that talk by saying, you know, I'm really not smart enough to say 100 years from now what that list is going to look like. But I am smart enough to say there'll be a list and it'll be equally as impressive. And I think that's what we see as the year has ahead. And again, I think healthcare, energy, the environment, and 
20, 30 years from now, it may be some other issue, right, that'll be that. Uh, but, you know, someone's going to come along with some great idea, and it's going to affect us in the same way that those great ideas have affected us. I'm, I'm, I think back to uh, the, your involvement, my involvement in the Lemelson program, yes. where uh, uh, there was an effort to try to convince young people that there were still many, many things to invent, that yeah. they all hadn't been invented, yes, and, yes. and there's still great opportunities to solve these problems moving right, forward. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so in terms, of, I just wanted to touch, we, we talked a little bit about it, but publications. You, you've authored a number of books and countless articles. Mm -hmm. Is publishing something you enjoy as much as research, or is it just a, a necessary byproduct? Um, I, I uh, very much like writing. In fact, uh, I'm not sure it's so writing. I like editing. So I, when I, I, when I uh, was the editor of this journal for five years, this was, I was, this was actually crazy. I edited every single paper. I mean, I copy edited every single paper. And I get a great charge out of copy editing. I, I, I try to be a very careful writer. Uh, so writing, I think, uh, in some ways is, uh, can be very painful. It's hard work to write well. Right? Uh, on the other hand, I, I think it's actually very important. And I, I think it's an obligation of, we, uh, of uh, us as academics to write. I mean, it's, it's one thing to have a great idea and to discuss it with 20 students or two students or whatever. But that doesn't move society along, right? Mm -hmm. What moves society along is the cumulative effort of all of us of sharing our knowledge and making that knowledge available to all of us. So one, I think that publication is, is essential. I think it's essential for progress. Uh, whether it has to be published in the way we can, uh, have done in the past in terms of the, the journal publication or whether there's other mechanisms for doing this in the web and others. But I think actually publication is very important. Um, it's very hard work, uh, and uh, I think particularly publishing uh, research papers is very hard work because you've got to write all this stuff down, get in a place that's comprehensible, and of often when you're thinking up new ideas, it's hard to articulate it. And then you've got to go through uh, what we have as refereeing processes, so it goes through peer review and scrutiny, and it comes back, and they always say you've got to change this, and you've got to redo this and change that. Uh, but yet, it, in the end, product typically is much better than what is a result of it. So it's, I think it's a very valuable process. It's very important. Um, I wouldn't say it's as much fun as doing the research. Uh, I think doing the research is really fun, right? And sort of sitting around and scratching your head and say, well, I don't know how to do that, and let's figure something out how to do that. I, I still have a couple of students, and I was meeting with one this morning, and we're really puzzling over this issue, and uh, I keep telling them, Come back next week, Matthew, and come on. You figure it out. You can do it, right? And we'll, you know, we'll spend an hour and toss around some ideas. Uh, but it's uh, it's remarkable fun to do that. So, in terms of this uh, ongoing uh, connection to students, is yes. it's something that you've done all the way through? Is it is it is it is that necessary? Is that connection? Um, uh, is, is still necessary and still very beneficial for you? Yeah, it's re it's very important to me, All right, And uh, it, uh, in some ways, it keeps me sane, right? I mean, in terms of all this administration that I'm, uh, I have been doing, I'm doing. Uh, it's it's quite different than when I was young, though. I mean, when I was young, uh, you know, I would spend as much time as the students uh, doing the research and digging in and doing all this. Now I, uh, you know, they're my eyes and ears, right? So they go out and they read the journals, they bring back the information, uh, and so it's a different kind of process. But you know, hopefully you bring some wisdom and some experience to the table, which they don't bring. They bring the youth and enthusiasm. Yes. Well, and you also bring the thing that you like, that you also are very good at, it, and that's the editing. Yes, so that's, that's true. a very valuable that's contribution true. to that. Yeah. Uh, and finally, in terms of publication, is writing a textbook a factor more difficult than the, than than the research articles that you talked about, or? Yeah, no, writing yeah. a textbook is enormous hard work, right? Um, I've actually got one sitting on my computer that I started to write the year before I was dean. So this is now 11 years ago, something, 10, 11 years ago. And the remarkable thing for this is I was teaching a course, sort of the last full-fledged course that I taught uh, all by myself. And I decided that uh, I didn't quite like any of the textbooks for it. And so I ended up, and I don't know how I did this, I ended up in one semester writing about, it must have been 250 pages of a textbook, right, in one semester. I don't, I, I just, I, to this day I can't figure out how I did it. So I think I wasn't sleeping. I was really motivated for doing this. I uh, wrote up these notes, uh, and, but unfortunately they've been sitting there, and I, I was actually thinking, I should really get back to these and get it out the door.
Yeah, and get back to it, like, while you're a president of... Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah, 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 that's right. (laughs) But start out with uh, just a more general question of... um, A portion of MIT's mission statement reads, to advance knowledge and educate students in science and other areas of scholarship that will best serve the nation and the world. Can you talk a bit about MIT's rich history of encouraging and supporting the development of similar institutions around the globe? Yeah, I think M- MIT uh, uh, serves as a model for the world. Uh, it's, uh, I've always said that there's very few institutions of higher learning that mean something to the world. And uh, you could, I guess, point to Cambridge and Oxford and Harvard. But MIT is one of those institutions, and it's a very small number. And uh, we're rather unique in that circle in terms of what we are and what we represent. Uh, I think MIT represents, to me, several things. I mean, one is this uh, um, ultimate uh, meritocracy, right? And, uh, the, and I think some of this comes out of engineering. Engineering is the road to upward mobility. I mean, who would have imagined that someone from my background, right, would end up becoming a professor at MIT, institute professor, and president of this new university? Um, just as a little aside, uh, when I was dean, it's a bit of bonding exercise. We took the uh, department heads away uh, one weekend to Endicott House. And uh, we uh, started to, uh, I, so this was the evening before, so it was a Friday night. And so I decided to uh, just get things rolling. we just go around the room and say a little bit about background, right? And so I started about you know, the fact that my grandfather was uh, a laborer, you know, dug out his own wine cellar, uh, my father loaded rail cars at night to support going to college and his young family, etc. So this was my story of upward mobility. Right? So now we start going around the room, right? And everyone around the room has a sadder story than this in terms of their upbringing. Until we get to Dick Yule, our former, our friend and former uh, uh, associate dean, and Dick talks about you know growing up in Shanghai and then having to leave Shanghai in terms of all the turmoil was going on, basically with nothing and his impoverished thing. And what really struck me about that was uh, MIT was a, a sort of, and this were the department heads of the School of Engineering at MIT, was this sort of uh, living memorial to uh, the ultimate meritocracy, right, in terms of this. And that's, this is part of what MIT represents. So this doesn't quite answer your question. But I think the fact that we're a model for the ultimate meritocracy, I think, is something very important to the world. Um, clearly a model for engineering. Uh, and we're also a model for the fact that, you know, I think what MIT strives to do is not just do good work, uh, but to do leading work, right, in terms of leading the nation, leading the world and what it does. So that's one answer to that question is we serve as this model. The second is that we, I think, uh, take as one of our responsibilities is uh, helping others uh, who want to initiate uh, similar activities, similar programs. And, you know, the, the classic one we, we refer to as IIT Kanpur, right, where we were involved in the early days of helping to establish in that In the 1950s, wasn't Yes, it? in the 1950s. But we've done things in Egypt, we've done things in a variety of other ways. And most recently, of course, we're doing, uh, helping Abu Dhabi create the, the Mazdar Institute of Science and Technology, and then this new effort in Singapore, the Singapore University of uh, Technology and Design. And again, I think these are, and we're working with uh, Portugal and helping them. It's not quite to create a new institution in that sense. But uh, I think these are in part uh, our, so our social responsibility uh, to engage with the world, to help the world develop these activities. And in part, these provide valuable resources to MIT and help us to uh, achieve some of the things we want to do in uh, zip, code, zip code 02139 as well. Yes. You know? Great answer. Great yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about the the about the uh, the global MIT initiative and how that will impact the educational experience of MI, of our students? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think all of us think now that uh, uh, students, all of us, should have a, a global perspective on the world. Markets have become globalized. Information has become globalized. Uh, uh, Tom Friedman writes that the world is flat. Uh, I don't think it's quite flat, it's spiked maybe in some <laughs> ways, but it's c- certainly fluid in that sense. And so I think we have a, a, an obligation to uh, provide a certain global perspective to our students. 
Uh, and there's a wide variety of ways of doing that. There's a talk that I've given several times, which is called uh, Globalization of the Residential University, which starts to talk about this issue. And there's many ways you can go about doing this. One is just uh, internationalizing the curriculum, so making sure there's international examples, international perspectives. Uh, one is to uh, provide an international community, to bring together people from different cultures and different uh, aspects, different worldviews, if you will. Uh, a second is to provide students with opportunities to get out there and experience uh, the, the, uh, the, the world. And there's a wide variety of ways of doing that, whether, whether it's internships or not. Uh, so that, I think we have a responsibility for doing that. It's clear that uh, this has become something that's become increasingly important to MIT and almost all of the universities. Now the question is how to do it. Right? And uh, MIT uh, has the, the luxury uh, of uh, being a world-renowned brand name, as do a few other places. And so we can do some things in the world that other places can't. The dream of most every place in the world is to have their own MIT. Uh, is to have MIT plop down there, for us to plop down MIT there, uh, or for them to replicate MIT in one way or another. Um, MIT has decided it's not going to have foreign campuses in that sense. Um, that's a strategic choice MIT makes. It's a it's a um, something that's interesting to reflect upon. You know why is it that universities almost all have one campus, or if they're a state school, they have several campuses, but they're, they're localized. Why doesn't MIT have a campus in California and a campus here or a campus somewhere else? And you can say the same thing internationally. Uh, we start from uh, this as a local university, as a regional university, then we become maybe international, national, then international. Now we're striving to become global, right? Whatever that means. Uh, it's different from international. Um, I think if one can imagine uh, in, a, in a future that uh, people could have multiple campuses in different locations of the same high quality. I think people are concerned about devaluating the brand name and devaluating the quality. Uh, one startling example of this right now is INSEAD. INSEAD, has, uh, INSEAD is a uh, business school that operates out of uh, France. Uh, they have two campuses, one in Fontainebleau and one in Singapore. They're essentially equal in terms of their, uh, their status now for INSEAD, equal in terms of students apply to INSEAD, not to one of the campuses, and then they get to choose after that what they do. I think they've shown that it works, that you can have two campuses uh, that are uh, equally valuable, and that gives them uh, regional input, or, uh, regional impact, both in Europe and in uh, Asia, in terms of Singapore and this. Uh, but I think the globalization you know, means many different things, and for our students, it's uh, a set of experiences, uh, a set of uh, heightened awareness about the, the uh, global world, the fact that doing business in uh, China is different than doing business in the United States, different than business, doing business in India. Uh, I think an interesting uh, aspect of this for MIT is, you know, engineering in China is not all different than engineering at MIT. Science in China is not all that different than science in, or, or science in the Soviet Union or Prussia now, or however you want to think about it. And so what does it mean for a technology-based institution? Uh, it might mean something a little different than it does for others. You know, for the business school, it's clear it means different things. There's different business practices in different countries. There's different uh, regulations for business in different countries. Now, you can say that there's different regulations for IP, there's different regulations for bringing things to the marketplace, and those are, I think, um, are provide some differences for the science and engineering schools. But for the science and engineering schools, it's just a matter of where you are and how you meet maybe local markets in some way. So it's a bit different, I think, for us. Well, it's also, I think, a, a difficult sell for, well, um, when you're studying at MIT, you know, you're a parent of a student studying at MIT, and you find out that uh, they that part of that is you're going to spend a semester studying somewhere else. Yes. The parent might feel that well, that is a uh, second tier education compared to what they would be getting at MIT. Mm -hmm. So does that kind of push back? Right, right. Yeah, I think I think um, there's clearly some legitimacy to that. You know, I think that MIT is a special place, as we said before, and so being here is a special place. I guess the question you have to ask yourselves is uh, how how long do you have to uh, to sip the juice in order to really feel that you've gotten the MIT experience, the MIT knowledge. Uh, and, uh, you know, do you have to be here eight semesters, or if you're here seven semesters, is that sufficient? And, you, and there's a trade-off here in the sense that you maybe a little, you miss a little bit of MIT and what's special about 
uh, being in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but you gain something by being in a different location. Exactly. You know? I think the trade-offs would offset. Yes. And, and right. that's the direction that things are heading in. And yes. You could argue that the student benefits from that time spent abroad. Um, we sure hope yes, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's funny, MIT's also made a very deliberate decision and just in terms of MIT to uh, to keep its faculty at about a thousand when there's yes. been a lot of pressures to, to increase the, the, the size of the student population. Yeah. But it, it's a tender, it's a, a, a you know, a, a, there's a balance there between resources and the quality of the faculty and all that. that yeah. Well, I, we, we could have a faculty I don't know, 50 percent our size of the same quality, just as we could have a student population 50 percent our size of the same quality. When I was dean, I argued for increasing the faculty size, and I couldn't convince uh, others in the administration that this was the right thing to do. But if you think about uh, the pressing problems of the of society of the world, many of them are, are problems that MIT can address and can contribute to. And by having more faculty uh, and more students, uh, we have the opportunity of doing that. I guess in th uh, the relevant question is, can you do that while maintaining the culture of the place and the quality of the place? Right. And yeah. I think you can, yeah. all right? uh, it, but it also has clearly implications in terms of facilities and uh, we're, we're bound uh, here in terms of being an urban university. Yeah. Well, this is a great uh, segue into my next question, and that is that this past October you were appointed president of the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, what are the opportunities and objectives associated with this exciting new challenge mm -hmm. for yourself and for the university? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think uh, one could uh, argue that uh, if you're an academic and if you've been around forever like I have, what's the most exciting thing you could do, right? And uh, pr among those, other than uh, playing left field for the Boston Red Sox, <laughs> uh, which would be pretty exciting, uh, other than those, I think it would be starting a new university, right? And starting a new university that's modeled after MIT. Yeah, and I, I often refer to the Singapore University of Technology and Design as uh, MIT within, sort of borrowing from Intel. Um, so if you were creating an MIT for these times, uh, how would you design it? What would you do, right? Uh, and that's what's particularly exciting about this for me personally, right? And I think it's particularly exciting for many of our colleagues in the administration of MIT. This is an opportunity of uh, experimenting, of doing some new things, uh, of hopefully creating something of enormous value. Uh, if by any measure we could wake up 50 years from now in this thing, or 20 years from now, whatever the number is, and this uh, has, in any sense, replicates MIT, I think we'd all be pretty happy. And so that's what, uh, why I think one might want to do something like this. And we're developing a, um, an approach to education that's uh, in some ways built upon the MIT DNA and genes, but is in many ways different. Uh, and so it's going to have no traditional degrees, not going to have a mechanical engineering degree or an electrical engineering degree. It's going to be taught in a way in which we're going to have more learning communities type of activities use modern technology platforms and these type of things to, to educate. And so it's, uh, you know, again, uh, if one had a life stream, it would be, can I, could I recreate MIT, right? And we have, a, we have an opportunity of trying to do that. That's great. And, yeah. and in terms of the, uh, the approach that you're considering, uh, that is that I understand that the university is exploring, uh, and you just referenced it, doing away with traditional academic departments and organizing the university according to technology and science clusters instead mm -hmm. to support the interdisciplinary nature of its programs and encourage collaboration across disciplines. How has this approach been influenced by your work at MIT? Um, well, first of all, you've done your homework. I'm, pretty, I'm quite impressed. Uh, well, again, MIT uh, has it's imbued with this interdisciplinary culture, this interdisciplinary uh, act, uh, activity. Um, on the other hand, it's sort of captured by its legacies, right, as any institution is, right? And it's uh, captured by the uh, evolution of higher education in the United States. Uh, and the higher, higher, higher education in the United States has uh, evolved in terms of uh, schools, well-defined schools, well-defined departments, well-defined degrees. Um, you know, as we 
uh, as we understood science and uh, captured science, then we developed technologies that use that science, and that became our departments. And so we start with civil engineering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you think about for these times, I mean, in mechanical engineering now we hire a physicist, we hire chemists, uh, we hire biologists uh, bio or biological engineers. Uh, this becomes such a mixture of activities. So one, as we, just, as we start to design the university, we recognize what's happening to MIT. Now, maybe not happening structurally in terms of the organization of the place in the quite the same way, but it's hap happening organically in terms of the, 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 the growth of the place. And so you find people with all kinds of backgrounds dispersed around the departments. And at least when I was dean, you could hardly tell which department someone should go in when we were hiring many of the people you were hiring, because they could go in multiple departments. And we're going to start, the, the uh, SUTD is going to be a small place as we start. Um, it's, it's going to be about MIT size, eventually about 4,000 undergraduates. So we have an opportunity of uh, starting with a more fluid structure, uh, not being hostage to the legacies, if you will. Uh, not that MIT is, but we were, you're, you're, you're captured by those legacies, I would say. Uh, so we're going to start with no schools, no departments, uh, no deans, uh, these terrible deans, right, you know, getting in the way of things. Um, now, of course, we'll wake up 20 years from now, and I'll bet they'll be more structured of this place, right? But we'll start with this very interdisciplinary uh, structure uh, of an opportunity, I think, of uh, mixing and matching in, in unusual ways. Uh, and I think that'll give us at least as a start of uh, of imbuing the place with this interdisciplinary uh, structure and uh, flavor of spirit of cooperation uh, within the people and among the people, which MIT fortunately has already. But I think if we started with a university with traditional structures, it would be harder to replicate MIT. And this is this is, you could say in a very positive way. This is a way of replicating MIT, acknowledging that MIT has uh, a certain culture that's uh, hard to and develop in a, in a traditional organizational structure. That sounds very exciting. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, you, MIT colleagues' involvement mm -hmm. in uh, the start of this new university? Yeah, the, the uh, MIT's uh, faculty, uh, their involvement is going to be multifaceted. Uh, again, uh, the new university starts, I, I sometimes say there's no there there at this point, that we have no facilities, no faculty, no curriculum. Uh, very little financial resources, etc. So how do you start with something like this? And, and the way that Singapore has decided to do this is by getting a U.S. partner, and fortunately for us, that U.S. partner or collaborator is MIT. So the MIT faculty are going to do lots of things. Uh, one is they're developing the curriculum. So we've already developed the blueprint for the curriculum, the uh, overall skeleton of the, of the curriculum in terms of what it looks like, uh, some thoughts about how we'll deliver it. And over the next several months, we'll be putting uh, some meat on the bones in terms of that. Mm -hmm. So the MIT faculty will be developing new courses, brand new courses, and adopt, adopting and adapting some current courses. Uh, it will be helping to uh, attract faculty uh, uh, for the new place. It'll be helping to um, uh, teach those faculty. So we're going to have something called the Teach the Teachers program, in which the faculty, some of them who were hired, will spend a year at MIT sort of following around MIT faculty members, developing uh, uh, collaborations with the MIT faculty. Uh, the MIT faculty will be involved in uh, developing a uh, collaborative uh, research center. So there's going to be a co-located research uh, center, the uh, Singapore MIT International De Design Center, which will have operations and facilities both in Singapore and MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, the MIT faculty will be involved in um, the research for that program and helping to establish that research program. Uh, it'll be involved in assisting and advising on a variety of other things, uh, helping with uh, co-curricular activities, clubs, entrepreneurship, uh, just involved in a, in a wide variety of ways of uh, helping and assisting the university get going. Uh, some of the faculty are spending time in Singapore for an early deployment of the courses, of getting the courses up and running. Um, and So there's going to be, I think, pretty extensive uh, involvement of the MIT faculty. 
So, and MIT seems to welcome opportunities like this for its faculty to leave for a few years. Um, you explained a, a number of things that you did on your sabbaticals. And so how did you benefit from this kind of experience? And, um, or how do you think the faculty will? And, and how does MIT benefit from that? Yeah, MIT's uh, benefits are going to be rather direct, I think. Um, uh, it's hard to experiment at this scale at MIT. It's hard to experiment by uh, developing and adapting something, say, on the order of 80 courses, right? or 80 subjects, right? So we can run those experiments in Singapore, launch the courses. First of all, we'll have resources to do that. So Singapore provides resources at MIT to develop the courses, pilot the courses, and the like. We bring them to Singapore. Uh, those that are successful or seem to be successful, we bring back to MIT, or some may actually stay at MIT as they're going mm -hmm. over there. So some will be the flow of, of um, uh, the, the investment in education at MIT. This will be the largest investment, I think, of any single program in education at MIT. If you just look at the amount of uh, financial resources that will go into education, uh, this will be the largest. Um, the, and so we'll, we'll learn, we'll experiment and we'll learn and bring back things. Uh, we will be uh, working with uh, hopefully some very bright young people and so this will hopefully amplify the impact of MIT in terms of its research and its education. Uh, this, uh, the education will be uh, taking MIT and amplifying it through these faculty who are going over there in terms of teaching and developing course materials and the like, building upon the MIT base. Um, and so I think there's going to be, um, and we're also providing some opportunities for some students to get out involved. There'll be student exchanges, which will be uh, helpful in terms of that globalization that we talked right. about before. So students both here will be attending? Us. Yes, there'll be some students here attending uh, activities or participating activities. There'll be uh, international contests. Uh, the uh, Singapore University is also going to have a Chinese collaborator, Zhejiang University. Mm -hmm. So this will be an opportunity to link up MIT with Singapore and China in terms of, say, international contests for the students, uh, projects, international projects for the students. So there's going to be a rich array of activities for, uh, for the students and for the faculty. That's great. Yeah. And uh, you referenced this earlier, but um, the MIT culture seems to facilitate MIT faculty reinventing themselves throughout their careers here. Uh, your first teaching assignment at MIT was in the Sloan School, and then you went on to become Dean of the School of Engineering. What does that say about you, and what does that say about MIT? Well, I think it says a lot about MIT. We, I, we'll get back to what it says about me. But I think um, I sometimes say MIT is the only place in the world that would possibly pluck someone from the School of Management and make him or her Dean right, of Engineering. Uh, um, well, yeah, what it says about me is that uh, I, I uh, have crossed the boundaries between these two schools over the years. I've worked with both schools, uh, developed an, an understanding and a uh, sense of comfort in terms of both schools. Uh, that I, that, you know, my work is, even though I've been in the management school, has been pretty engineering-like, I would say, in some ways. And so it was... Uh, in some ways an unnatural act for me to, to make that transition. In some ways it was fairly natural in that sense. But it, I, I think it's in many ways the closest MIT has come in a, in a long time or maybe ever of taking someone external from the School of Engineering and making him or her dean. If you think of going to the Sloan School as external in that sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. Well, it's, it's a great illustration of the di interdisciplinary aspects of MIT's right. approach to education. Exactly. Yeah, I sometimes view myself as the example. <laughs> <laughs> so, and wh what did you see as the opportunities in becoming dean? Uh, what, did, what, were you, uh, what did you set out to do when you became dean of the School of Engineering? Well, there were lots of things. Uh, and one was to um, uh, invest in educational innovation in a variety of ways. And uh, uh, we did that by, um, one, through uh, technology. Uh, we had a program called iCampus with, uh, with Microsoft, and through iCampus, we, we spoke before about Jim Glass and some of his work in terms of uh, being able to extract uh, material from videos uh, and uh, be able to index and search videos and the like. 
Um, but we did a wide variety of other things like that, and I had hoped when I became dean to support those type of activities. Um, I, thought of, I thought that broadening the education of our students was a very good thing to do. And we developed this uh, program called UPOP, Undergraduate Practice Opportunities Program, which I'm quite proud of, uh, that uh, takes sophomores, it's a voluntary program for sophomores, and uh, provides them with an understanding of practice that uh, I think MIT historically has been a marvelous place at uh, educating students on basic technologies, basic science, but perhaps could have done a, a better job of uh, educating them about practice. And the question, a legitimate question was, can we provide more understanding of practice without undermining the fundamentals of MIT? And in that context, we developed this program, UPOP. Uh, it's voluntary. And about 40% now of the, all the engineers, uh, students, sophomore students take it. It provides them with this broadening experience. So there's educational things that uh, we hope to accomplish. Uh, we, there was a hope of attracting um, uh, uh, more talent to the School of Engineering, particularly minorities and women. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we made great strides in attracting many women faculty members. And it's actually quite wonderful now to see uh, a number of them getting tenure. Uh, folks that we had hired during that period. And we made some progress with minorities, not as much as we might have liked, but made some progress with minorities. And that was clearly an objective that we had. And then the other was, uh, you know, I, um, I at one point had this list of about eight or ten things that uh, people in university administration do. One is you're a, you're a patron for the folks and you try to help the departments accomplish what they want to accomplish, and I think that's very important. Uh, you represent the place of the world, uh, and we uh, and developed, I think, broader communications for the School of Engineering. I mean, a, a curious thing when I became dean was that uh, the School of Engineering had no, no vehicle of its own for communicating to the world. Departments had materials and brochures. MIT had technology review, and in some ways that was the, the publication. And we developed an online uh, publication newsletter every two months where uh, we spoke out about some of the things the school was doing. And I, tried to make those more, you know, many universities do that, and it's just a bunch of uh, you know, lists of, of tags in terms of places where you go on the internet. We actually wrote articles about some of the things that we were doing, mm -hmm. uh, and so we tried to uh, develop better communications, um, better outreach of the faculty, and then um, support uh, uh, some of the um, more important uh, technological developments, and there was Clearly, the evolution of bioengineering at MIT was pretty important. What I call tiny technologies, it was micro and nanotechnologies. Uh, uh, I spent a couple, several evenings trying to come up with a word to capture that, and finally it was tiny technologies, which some people like and some people hate. But I think it captures the sense of what it was all about, that uh, the technologies, we talked before about going back to the 1900s, that the technologies, I sometimes refer to the 19th century as the century of the large. And what do I mean by that? It was a century of large technologies. So think of, of oil refinery plants. Think of steam engines. Why are the, the bays at MIT so large? Because we had all these big technologies. It was also the evolution of large corporations. So prior to 1900, almost all manufacturing was craft-based. And over the last century, we had the evolution of the GMs and the Boeings of the world and all the, all the larger manufacturing companies. And I think you could argue that this century increasingly is going to be the century of the small. Mm -hmm. It's the tiny technologies, the micro nanotechnologies, entrepreneurship, small companies, and the like. So one wanted to help to uh, develop those set of, of technologies and areas. Engineering systems was one of them, as we talked about. Um, and then a third was to uh, uh, really uh, improve our uh, activities in the entrepreneurship arena. And, and there, uh, you know, we, we developed or actually brought over to the school the Lemelson MIT program, the Dishbande Center for Technological Innovation. We'll work with students, uh, some in terms of the 100K competitions and other activities like that. And so again, to try to stimulate more of a, a, a the already rich uh, ecosystem of entrepreneurship uh, within MIT, uh, within the school. So there was a variety of things like that that I had hoped to accomplish. And of course, you go into these jobs and there's always surprises, things along, along the line that you didn't think necessarily was on your agenda when you started and you developed these over time in terms mm -hmm. of things. Yeah. Well, you also shepherded a number of uh, partnerships with industry. Yes, uh, yeah, that was another, can, yes. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about those? Sir? Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I, I, actually before I became dean, I had uh, very little experience in uh, individual fundraising. 
but had spent a fair amount of time uh, raising uh, funds and uh, relationships with industry. Uh, leaders for Manufacturing and System Design and Management Program were sort of the two prime examples. And uh, uh, MIT had already started, it launched on a program um, under Chuck Vest of trying to develop more industrial relationships. Amgen was the first of those. And we wanted to develop more of those that were based or related to the School of Engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say the two that I was most actively involved with at that time was uh, with Microsoft for iCampus the educational program and with HP, uh, the program we developed with HP on communications and uh, some uh, printing technologies and nanotech tiny technology type of things, but also to promote uh, those industrial uh, engagements. Uh, and I think they're very important actually for a place like MIT in terms of providing us uh, with access to uh, important problems, of reaching out to industry, uh, bringing in stimulations of industry, and providing a important source of support for exactly. uh, faculty the, and students. Yeah. There was, a, a, I think, a dramatic shift uh, in the, where that MIT's research support was coming from. As That's opposed correct. To, That's correct. And yeah. that was very deliberate. Um, very deliberate, and yes. You were part of that with partnering yeah. with Chuck Fest and, and others. others. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So um, to shift gears here just for a second, I, I just wanted to uh, ask you uh, about Sloan. Um, how do you see the Sloan's uh, role at MIT? Sloan School's role at MIT, that was awkwardly yeah. put. Um, management is very important to the world, as we know. I mean, it's, it's clear it's very important. And I think it's important that MIT is a strong force in the world of management. And we can play a particular role in that, of um, bringing a certain type of thinking to the world of management uh, that uh, you might say is analytic, it's uh, analysis-based approach to, to uh, management. And that's which I think in some ways uh, distinguishes Sloan. Uh, it's the minds at mind, it's rigor and relevance, however you want to think about that. Mm -hmm. Can we develop theories of management, conceptualizations of management, and then bring them to the world of practice? And in many ways, I think that's what uh, that Sloan represents. It also has a, um, um, a distinction of uh, being uh, part of the MIT ecosystem, right? And so it can connect with technologies. So areas like entrepreneurship, uh, areas like uh, industrial engagements about technologies. Uh, I think it has an important, uh, uh, important contributions to make to MIT and to the world. And I think there's important connections, I think, with the rest of MIT. And in terms of uh, Sloan's place in the world, um, what what is its significance, uh, or what sets it apart from, you know, from other business schools, uh, both nationally and globally? Well, I think it's this distinguishing characteristic as being part of MIT, and 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 the fluidity of MIT in terms of this crossing boundaries, uh, and the like. Um, in my own sense, in my own view, we could probably even do more in that regard. Uh, I think there's a delicate balance that Sloan has to make about being viewed as too techy uh, and uh, in a uh, more general management place. But I have this mental image that uh, some of the best leaders for society, managerial leaders, are people that are uh, technologists, people that have technology in their hearts and their souls. And that's where I think S Sloan can add a particular value, I think, to society of uh, of taking people who uh, are gr strongly grounded in technology and to uh, help them to become leading managers uh, and leaders within society. And, uh, you know, if Sloan can, uh, and I think Sloan does, uh, uh, and the more it can provide, provide that kind of role to the world, I think, uh, the more it distinguishes itself. I skipped over one question that I wanted to go back to, and that is uh, to ask you what you thought were the School of Engineering's strengths. Uh, well, the School of Engineering strengths, I think, is uh, uh, breadth and excellence. I mean, the fact that it covers uh, uh, the watershed of engineering broadly. I mean, there's hardly a, anything other than some, you know, traditional areas of engineering, such as uh, bridge building and sort of traditional things, which uh, it doesn't do much of anymore. Uh, it covers the full landscape of engineering, and uh, and it's excellent across the board. I mean, it just does it all uh, well. And the other uh, th thing that it does very well is, uh, as we discussed before, is um, uh, it takes leadership very seriously. It wants to lead the world of engineering. And it is continuing to challenge itself 
uh, and I think the faculty are continuing to challenge themselves about how they can lead. And the impressive thing about, uh, one of the impressive things about MIT and its faculty is uh, it uh, can change directions pretty quickly and, and move into new areas. Um, you know, I would take as an example what we're doing in the energy field right now or what we're doing in the bioengineering uh, related fields right now. Uh, these are important sea changes at MIT over a period of time. Uh, and it's because, it's, and I would say LFM was another example of that. You know, we understand an important societal issue, societal problem, and we go after it mm -hmm. right, with, with uh, uh, vigor and rigor, both, right? And uh, I think that's a distinguishing characteristic, uh, particularly the School of Engineering. It's, uh, it's very programmatically oriented. It, uh, it says, well, what's, what are the programs for the future? How can we think about the programs for the future? And those programs will be research programs, educational programs, so meet societal needs. I've heard it characterized that the world often, or particularly the nation, when you think back to, just think back to the development of radar, um, that the nation often turns to MIT to, uh, and, and asks uh, MIT for its assistance in solving its problems. Mm -hmm. Can you cite uh, a few examples of that and, uh, just from the last couple of decades? Or? Well, I would, I would say manufacturing was one in terms of the leaders for manufacturing. This whole energy field is another. Uh, I think we're seeing it increasingly in some uh, healthcare related issues. Um, think about cancer and the work that MIT is doing in the cancer field. You know, uh, one example of this, and this is not about solving the problem, but the one that I often use is uh, when there was all this hoopla about coal fusion years ago, right? And uh, almost instantaneously, where did the uh, center of gravity for all that discussions become. It became MIT, right? And so when there's an important uh, scientific issue, an important technology issue that the world uh, is uh, interested in, is puzzled about, however you want to think about it, quickly it becomes MIT, right? And I, that, that's pretty special. I think it makes MIT pretty special. In that. And that's a way in which it serves society. I agree, I agree. Um, I'm gonna ask you one uh, question about your uh, uh, your own place at MIT. Uh, uh, I'm just curious, you, you've been um, presented the honor of being appointed uh, an institute professor, only, only one of 14 faculty members to hold that distinction. How has this recognition of your academic achievements and commitment to MIT impacted your position here? Um, well, first of all, uh, this was uh, uh, a remarkable surprise to me. So uh, uh, Larry Bacow uh, sometimes tells the story that, uh, you know, I was called into the president's office and uh, uh, he was chair of the faculty at the time. And the chair of the faculty and the president uh, have the distinct pleasure of telling someone when they've been this. And Larry says it's the only time in his life he's seen me as speechless, right? <laughs> I just don't know what to say about this. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's clearly a very uh, distinctive, uh, distinguishing uh, position to hold. Um, what strikes me is um, uh, often how important this is to the world. Right? And, you know, I, I some, often just view myself, I'm a, I'm a simple professor, right? A simple professor, right? Uh, you know, I, I, hear, I hear I do my stuff. I was fortunate enough to get this remarkable honor. But boy, to the world, it means it means the world to the world, right? And uh, so I see this as I go around. People say, "Well, not only is a professor at MIT, but he's an institute professor at MIT." So it, it's clear it means something to the world, and I, and since it means something to the world, it clearly means something to me in that sense, yeah, right? It clearly means something to your colleagues at MIT. Yeah, and, and my colleagues, right. yeah, would yes. say the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a uh, remarkable honor. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And pretty humbling when you also I think of my colleagues who I had. I also I was uh, uh, I was pretty young when I got it. I remember John Deutsch coming up to me and saying, you know, you're too young to be a <laughs> <Mr>. professor. <laughs> exactly. Right. You haven't paid your dues. That's or right. Whatever. Exactly. Right. 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 <laughs> so I'm going to ask uh, some gen more general questions about MIT. Uh, yeah. uh, so over time, uh, w in during your your tenure here, what changes have you seen uh, in MIT's culture? and the student body, the faculty? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I would call, characterize a change in MIT's culture, but a change in the world, right, and, uh, which certainly affects our culture. 
that uh, the, the world has become a, a much more competitive place. Uh, I think it's harder for the faculty to secure resources uh, than when I first came. You know, when I first came, you wrote a proposal to the agencies and you got funded. Uh, it was less, it was less onerous, I think, to develop resources than it is now. And I think now uh, faculty have to work much harder, I think, at developing those set of resources. Um, uh, it's much more competitive to uh, attract uh, faculty and resources here. I mean, it used to be um, any, anybody who got an offer from MIT came. I just think we're still fortunate that almost everybody we make offers to still come, but we have to work really hard at it now, where I think in the past you just made the offer and you assumed people were coming. So it's become a much more competitive landscape for MIT. Uh, I think the other thing that's happened is uh, the world has turned and become more of an MIT type place. I think the world has recognized the importance of technology uh, in a very significant way uh, and the role of places like MIT in the world. Now about our culture, well the, I think the big, one of the biggest things in terms of the culture of the students is, now remember I came here, it was about three centuries ago, so it was, <laughs> it was uh, in the, in the early 1970s. Yep. And at that time, what was everybody's aspirations? You wanted to go to a big company, right, and get a good, secure job at a big company, and you'd stay there for 40, 50 years, and you retire. Right? I mean, that was the mental model of, this was, you know, I, I was a student in the 60s, came here in the early 70s. That's not the model anymore. I mean, first of all, that's uh, not the model of the world. You just don't go to any large company, whether it's GM or uh, Boeing or whatever, and typically stay there for 40, 50 years anymore. So the students are much more inclined to want to do things that are more entrepreneurial. They want to go to more uh, smaller companies, startup companies, and all those type of stuff. Start things. their own companies. Start their own companies. Now, of course, we went through this bubble in the late 90s in terms of the, the bubble, the famous bubble. And so I think that's modulated some now where they don't all think they're going to get rich in two years, maybe in quite the same way. Uh, I think we've also gone through this, um, I mean, um, now remember I came here in uh, uh, the Vietnam War era, right? And so there was this a remarkable social upheaval in the country at that time. Uh, and uh, this social upheaval at MIT. So I, I think at that time there was this enormous uh, feeling of social responsibility that people had to society and I think particularly war efforts and that kind of thing. And then I think we went through a long period in which there was less of that, right? And um, I think more of uh, let's go out and make our fortunes, uh, let's go out and, and do that. And now I think it's swing, swung back again, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you see more uh, interest in uh, developing world and uh, helping others, uh, not necessarily money for money's sake in quite that same way. So I think we've seen that shift. In the, in the aspirations of the students um, and the, the things that they they value and what they want to do, um, the faculty. Uh, and I think, as I said, life's become more complicated for them. Um, I think they're probably more a little bit more interdisciplinary now than they were. I mean, even though we did a lot of interdisciplinary things back then, mm -hmm. uh, you clearly see more crossover between. Well, I think it's like almost all the schools now. I think you see a lot more crossover between science and engineering, architecture, engineering, Sloan School, and the rest of the institute. So I think it'll become more interdisciplinary in that that sense. Um, and the administration? Um, well, we've we, we've retained this uh, sense of uh, of. Uh, the administration being here to help the faculty. Uh, you know, we, we still are one of the few places in the world that don't, doesn't have a Senate, doesn't have this sort of acrimony, can, ongoing acrimony between the administration and the faculty. Um, you know, I think the administration has grown, uh, uh, and the administrative side of the House, I think, has grown over time. Uh, some of that, I think, is predicated by external forces and government regulations and the like. Uh, but uh, we're, pro we're probably we're not as lean, I think, as we were uh, mm -hmm. 40 years ago of that order. Um, again, we're, we're probably similar to other universities in that sense as well. Um, uh, but, you know, you see um, 
in some way, I, I tried to resist this when I was dean, but it's the dean's office growing, and the provost's office growing, the president's office growing, the, the, the VP administration's office is various is growing and stuff. I think we have, one always has to resist that because I think it's a natural thing. And we all have to remember, I, I, I used to have to, I often reminded myself when I was dean, you know, we're here to, not because we're here to be here, we're here to help the faculty and help the students accomplish all the great deeds they want to do. And uh, I think, to its credit, the MIT administration maintains that view. Great. Yeah. And uh, this is a well. This part's going to kind of. I'm just going to continue on, but this is a a, a big question. The, the, what do you think is and should be uh, MIT's role in the world? Uh, MIT's role should be the leading science and technology institution, period, right? That is, we, we lead the world, lead the nation and lead the world in science and technology and, and as we say, in other areas of scholarship. I mean, I think uh, clearly uh, uh, our footprint in the humanities, arts, and social sciences is quite important. Uh, though we, have to, we should do it with the MIT brand, right, and that links to this uh, science and technology base. Same with Sloan School, same with the School of Architecture. But I think, again, to sort of uh, be this very special place in the world and, and uh, always remember that we are this special place and should stay this special place, right? Uh, and sometimes, uh, not sometimes, but not to lose sight of that, right? Uh, uh, not to become uh, uh, another university in that sense. Uh, and I think the, the forces are sometimes always to, uh, for all these universities to become like each other. And I, I always say one of the great things about the, the U.S. higher education system is you've got a Yale and you've got an MIT, and they're very different. Right. They're both very important, and they both do great stuff for the world, right? And how, how, could you just, how would you describe MIT's uniqueness in that regard? Well, it's, it's, it's this anchor on science and technology. I mean, it's really important that it anchors on science and technology. Uh, I would say it's this interdisciplinary nature in terms of what it does. Uh, it's this uh, balance of research and education, of, of bringing those together. Now, lots of universities would say that, but I think you know, the distinguishing feature is um, the science and technology and you know this sort of uh, a little bit the preeminence of engineering you know the fact that uh, engineering drives a lot of what goes on here it's a big part of what we do there's the uh, engineering ethos that, that drives the place uh, also uh, i think no, we should just never forget this ultimate meritocracy right you know we're all about meritocracy bringing the best and brightest and providing this road to upward mobility. You know, I'm f very proud of the fact that MIT continues to provide substantial financial assistance, make this place uh, affordable for uh, people that uh, couldn't afford to go to the great institutions, the uh, learning institutions of the world. There is still yeah. a lot of first generation a lot, of, lot of first, college graduates. A lot, lot of first generation people, and I think there always should be lots of first generation people. And any changes you would like to see in the? Well, I don't know if it's changes, but I think MIT really needs to think about um, its uh, footprints in terms of international students versus domestic students. You know, it only has now about 7 8% international undergraduate students, right? Uh, whether that's the right thing to do in the future or not. Uh, I, I do think that it's uh, thinking strategically about its international reach in the world ahead. I mean, it's, we're going to start getting competition from great institutions around the world, and how do we think about maintaining our preeminence in this field? Uh, I think thinking through that. Um, clearly, MIT has been, has to think about its whole uh, financial posture. You know, that uh, we've, that's another thing that's changed, I would say, over the last 40 years. That, uh, you know, it used to be you could rely upon tuition and other very secure forms of uh, financial support from the federal government and others to support the place. Now we have to rely on the endowment, we have to rely on gifts. So we ha we're, we're uh, operating in a much more volatile financial environment mm -hmm. than we were 40, 50 years ago. And that affects the place uh, rather drastically. I mean, we've seen this the last uh, two or three years with the economic downturn, right? That we're no longer isolated from that. You know, we're, we're part of that system. Uh, our, our funding depends upon returns on endowment and gifts and all these type of things. And so 
you know, the more we can stabilize that, the better the, of the place will be. But it, it may be that it's, uh, 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 we can't turn back the clock and, and go back to sort of the, that corporate funds. But it would be wonderful if we had this very solid, secure funding where we didn't have to worry about these ups and downs of the markets. Yes. Yeah. In, in terms of looking back over your career, what, what are the other, we, we've already touched on some of them, but what are some of the other uh, key institutional turning points that you experienced in your time at MIT? In what sense? In the sense of, of well, I think that the shift from, uh, well, certainly in the makeup of the undergraduate population in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, uh, you know, attracting more, more women. Yeah. Um, and um, and also some of the more uh, significant shifts in terms of uh, uh, you know these recent initiatives, um, the energy initiative, mm -hmm. the cancer, and any of those over the last. Um, you know, I would say that you know there's clearly been a shift in terms of demographics of the place, and uh, we're a much healthier place now, I think, because of it. Um, I think there's also the um, the um, just this impact, which I'm not sure we've fully come to internalize, and that's the impact of technology, right, in terms of this. I mean, the fact that we all carry these computers in our pro pro pockets now, right, I mean, it's just quite remarkable that, and you've got your version, I've got my version of this. What is the impact upon education for that, right, in terms of we think about it? And the fact that every student now can be carrying a, a computer in his or her pocket or purse or whatever, um, how do we think about that in terms of how we educate folks? Mm -hmm. uh, someone's going to figure that out at some point, right? And I know you've been trying and others have been trying at MIT to think about that. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we are the product of an evolving educational system. Uh, you know, I look around this room, I still see chalkboards and chalk, right? Uh, not that that's a bad thing in terms of some of our very best lecturers use that technology. Um, but, uh, you know, given the way young people learn now, given the way that they interact with each other in the world, how does that change what we do fundamentally? And does it change what we do fundamentally? I think things like that are really important for us to, to think about. And my own sense is that will evolve over time. I don't think we're going to wake up two years from now and say, we're going to change the whole curriculum based upon those technologies and the like. But over time, they'll gradually make some changes, I think, in terms of the way things are doing. But, you know, the kids learn uh, in a very different way than I ever learned, right? And, mm -hmm. Uh, at some point, I'm going to teach you're going to, you or someone else going to teach me how to Twitter and do some of these other things. I've never done a Facebook in my life, right? But I think with starting this new university, I've got to learn some of these tools, right? Because that's how the kids interact these days, right? And, uh, and they're multitasking. They've got four windows on their computer at once, yeah. and they're still studying, but they're, yeah. you know. Well, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was meeting before a um, uh, Department of uh, Education commission at one time. This was the uh, Spellman Commission on Higher Education. And they were talking about the young kids multitasking. And it's true they do, I said. But you know, I multitask too, right? I said, I, I actually, uh, the co-author of my first book was Johnny Carson, right? Uh -huh. What do I mean by that? I said, I wrote that book while watching Johnny Carson at 11.30 at night, right? And so we've all always multi-processed uh, multi in, uh, in, so, in certain ways. Yes. But it's clear they do it in ways that, uh, you know, it's, it's actually hard. I think maybe you and you, those of you behind the camera can imagine this. I can't imagine it. I mean, just the, how these, what these kids do and how they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm going to try to learn a little bit more of it. Right? Okay, and a couple of last questions. Um, and this is just about the, the memories of your time at MIT, but could you tell us a bit about uh, particularly memorable or influential uh, colleagues or mentors that have uh, left an impression on you? Um, well, the memories, uh, I mean, some of the most stark memories are, uh, may sound silly to you, but uh, some of these uh, Mo moments of working with students, right, and uh, just being engaged with them and sort of thinking and tossing the and debating, and then watching them graduate. I mean, it just uh, it's such enormous pride uh, when you see these people graduate and then uh, develop their professional career. Now, in terms of uh, mentors, these type of things, um, I don't think well, I put kids' characters. Some of the yeah. characters that you've well, come across. Uh, 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 you know, I've been I've been fortunate 
uh, to work with a number of really fantastic people. Um, and uh, I've also been fortunate enough to um, co-direct programs with people. So uh, Kent Bowen, who I mentioned before, and then Ed Crowley, who I mentioned before. These were these are two very, very skilled administrators. They're very different type of people in many ways, but very skilled administrators. And it clearly was a privilege to, to interact with them. Um, uh, Abe Siegel, who was the, the associate dean at the Sloan School uh, when I got hired, and uh, uh, I think Abe sort of took me under his wing and you know sort of thought of me as his son in some ways, and uh, was always very generous to me, uh, very helpful to me. Um, I've always gotten a charge out of Jerry Wilson. Uh, you know, I worked pretty closely with him in developing LFM and the like, and uh, uh, just. Uh, you know, to many people, uh, Jerry was sort of a gruff uh, person. I always found him very charming, mm -hmm. uh, and I sort of loved the fact that he was so honest uh, with me and other people. Uh, Joel Moses, uh, who was this fant utterly fantastic person, Joel was uh, one of the most intellectual people at MIT, mm -hmm. and uh, he's always such a pleasure to be around him, uh, always so engaging, always something interesting to say or do. Uh, he is a bit of a character. Um, uh, who might be some other people? Um, well, I've I've, uh, I've got these uh, remarkable uh, operations research colleagues. You know, I, I wouldn't c call them characters necessarily, but these are uh, people that uh, I've grown up with, uh, and in many cases uh, they've grown up with me in the sense that they're younger than I am, right? And so I'm uh, just proud of the, the watching them grow and having you know some modest influence on their lives or effect, you know, effect on their lives and interacting with them. Uh, um, when I went to the dean's office, I um, coined the term the dean's team to refer to us all. And I, one of the great pleasures to me at MIT has just been working with others and having, being part of a team and, and being able to do things as part of a team. And so, you know, all the people I've worked with in those capacities, uh, Dick Yu, who was, was my associate dean, uh, uh, Dick is a real character. I mean, when he talks about him giving birth to his four kids, you know, helping his wife give birth, and uh, how that came started as an accident the first time, and then he decided if he helped give birth to one, he had to help give birth to all of them. And uh, you know, he's just uh, one of these people that you always turn around and you scratch your head. He's, you know, he does everything so remarkably. But mm -hmm. and, you know, the fact that we've got these people at MIT who uh, uh, are just uh, extraordinarily remarkable in terms of all the things that they do, uh, you know. Be, Watching Bob Langer at work is always such a pleasure, and uh, the fact that you know he can uh, accomplish as much as he does. Uh, uh, having interacted with John Deutsch over the years, uh, mm -hmm. you know another like Jerry Wilson, uh, someone who um, uh, uh, is very forthright, and you sort of know where he stands. But you know, uh, great people. Uh, clearly, um, uh, Chuck Vest, Bob Brown, uh, that. You know, I was very fortunate. When I, when I was uh, dean of engineering, I used to say, we have three deans of engineering at MIT. There's me, there's Chuck Vest, and Bob Brown, right? And, and uh, uh, there was a certain sense of that. And actually, it was, it was, um, it was uh, really good for me, because uh, I'm not a t typical engineer. I, I'm not a technologist in that sense. I'm a, you know, applied mathematician. Uh, and uh, Chuck was somebody who knew uh, certain aspects of engineering, you know, mechanical engineering, and these type of things very well. Bob knew the chemical engineering and learned the bio stuff quite well. So it was actually, uh, 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 you know, in many ways, you don't want to have uh, your boss or your boss's boss uh, be in your field because they, they might, you think they might micromanage you. But in this case, it actually worked very well, and it was sort of wonderful to do that. Uh, um, so, you know, just the, the whole cast of characters, right? Uh, well, M MIT has quite a track record, it seems, as of late, of uh, developing college presidents. When you yes, consider that list, and yes, that's I true. know everyone is thrilled that uh, that you've joined that list. Mm -hmm. And uh, t tell me about uh, uh, life after the college presidency. Uh, well, uh, first of all, they're going to have to drag me out of this place, right? Because I, j I just love it so much, and I can't imagine doing anything else in my life. Uh, this might not be the best thing for MIT, but it might be the best thing for me. I don't know. Uh, my sense is I'm going to come back and uh, you know uh, d do some do, do some serious work. Might finish this book, you know. Uh, I, I get some things done with some more students. Um, 
participate in the community. I mean, one nice thing about stepping down from dean is I've been able to get back a little bit with my colleagues in, in OR, participate in some activities at the Operations Research Center, those type of things. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, who knows what's going to happen three or four years from now, right? And that for any of us. Right? Well, I think yeah. everybody looks forward to your return after, yeah. Yeah. after Singapore. So, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about the Singapore-MIT Alliance, your role in that, and how that program has benefited both MIT and Singapore? Yeah, let me start, Larry, by saying a little bit about the origins of the program. So it, it started in the late 1990s when Bob Brown was Dean of Engineering. And Bob was approached about establishing an, an, uh, an MIT institute in Singapore, that is a, an outpost for MIT. And uh, rather than doing that, Bob said, well, let's first do an assessment of the universities and an assessment of what MIT might be able to contribute. And I was uh, one of the 17, I think 17 faculty members who was involved with it. I was the only non-school engineering person. I was a Sloney involved with that. Again, a little bit of this crossover in terms of not knowing where I belong maybe in some ways. Um, and so we uh, uh, did this assessment. And out of that assessment came the notion of developing joint educational and research programs uh, with Singapore. Uh, this was the so-called Singapore-MIT Alliance. And the program started with five uh, educational programs in five different areas. I was actually involved in one of them, the uh, program in uh, computational engineering, uh, high-performance computation, I think it was called. Uh, and actually, at one point, hit one of, one of the PhD students. But soon after we developed that program, I became dean. So I inherited it uh, in terms of administrative responsibility, sort of shared with Bob, uh, Bob Brown, who was then a, by that time provost. Uh, and the program has uh, developed, uh, uh, I think, marvelously over the years. It's had, uh, I think, at this point, over a thousand publications that have come out of it. Uh, and uh, it's been, a, I think, of uh, great benefit to Singapore in the sense of uh, helping uh, to develop uh, programs at NUS and NTU in an a American-style culture. Uh, part of the objective of Singapore was to, for the universities to become more Western in terms of their outlook, and I think this has helped them become more Western. But at MIT, it's had lots of benefits. Uh, one is it's provided opportunities for our faculty to have a global experience, uh, a global experience in an area that was quite comfortable, English-speaking, uh, and yet very international, very cosmopolitan, uh, very multi-ethnic in terms of its background. Uh, it provided uh, opportunities for MIT to create new programs, so there's now a master's program in computational design and optimization. That was an outgrowth of that program. A new program in uh, manufacturing, a uh, master's program in uh, mechanical engineering was an outgrowth of that program. It provided research funding for a wide variety of students uh, and faculty. Uh, it provided opportunities for, to create facilities at MIT, distance learning. So this was MIT's uh, broadest uh, experiment in distance education, certainly point-to-point -point distance education, where we were teaching 12 time zones and 12,000 miles away uh, every day, right? And so it developed rooms like the one we're sitting in in terms of providing technology for that. It provided teaching assistance uh, for the MIT faculty. It provided endowment for the MIT faculty. So that endowment has led to uh, graduate fellowships uh, at MIT uh, and to uh, investing in some faculty positions at MIT. Uh, and so there's been long-lasting uh, implications of that in terms of uh, the long-lasting contributions to MIT's uh, uh, long-term health, financial uh, health, if you will, as well as uh, shorter-term contributions in terms of funding important research, providing new educational programs. So that was SMA, and it um, morphed after the first five years into so-called SMA II, which now MIT felt more comfortable and now gave uh, dual degrees, uh, and so there was degree uh, both in uh, MIT and in Singapore, not joint, but dual degrees. And um, uh, I was uh, working with Tony Patter at the time, who was the director of the uh, SMA program. Uh, I was dean, and uh, we were putting together the uh, the second program in terms of the second program. So uh, I had sort of uh, inherited that program from Bob and uh, helped administratively to steward it over a period of about eight or nine years until I stepped down as dean. Uh, then, uh, uh, and Singapore had this uh, strategy of trying to uh, become a, an international knowledge hub, uh, and certainly a regional knowledge hub. <coughs> it did this in a variety of ways. 
uh, uh, MIT was a leading participant in terms of SMA and then later SMART, as I'll get, I'll get to. But it also had attracted Duke to come in and establish the Duke uh, and U.S. Medical School. NCAA, as I mentioned before, to create a campus there. Chicago has an operation for its business school there. At one point, I think I counted up probably about 30 universities that had uh, significant uh, activities there. Uh, none more, none deeper than MIT, though. Uh, as part of this, this the government decided uh, to increase its uh, investment in R&D and uh, go to world standards up to about 3% of its GDP. And they had many elements of the research program that was going to develop for that, but part of this was to develop an academic cluster to attract some of the world's best universities to come and set up operations, foreign research operations. And MIT was the first university it turned to for this. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I was dean at the time when they wanted to do this. Uh, Subra Suresh uh, was the lead faculty member, and I was the lead member of the faculty in developing that program. Uh, and this was an opportunity for us to have an uh, experiment with a foreign research campus. Actually, a building a four-building complex will be one of the prime occupants of that complex of conducting research. And uh, the, the primary reason we're there is because we can do uh, leading-edge research, particularly leading-edge re leading research we can't do in the United States. So for example, our first program was in infectious disease. And in that program, we were looking at uh, malaria and other pathogens uh, of, of the region. Uh, you didn't want to be studying those pathogens back in the US, uh, bringing the pathogens back to study. You also had access to blood banks and other uh, sources of information in the region, which you just didn't have at US. The second program was in sensors for the environment and modeling for the environment. There again, they were looking at regional issues. You can't do regional issues from MIT. You could do those there. So that program, um, when uh, we were making the transition uh, from deans, when uh, Subra and I basically swapped positions, uh, he became the, um, the dean of engineering. And at that point, there didn't seem to be anybody uh, who was quite ready to take on this program. I probably should have gone out to pasture at that point and taken a sabbatical or done something, finished my book or done whatever. Uh, but uh, crazy as I was, said, uh, you know, this is, I think, sufficiently important at MIT. And there seems to be no one else to do that. Uh, I'll take this on for a period. And so I uh, became the director of SMART for a period of uh, two years, where I was, for personal reasons, uh, I couldn't go to Singapore full time. I was commuting. So I was actually going a, a week a month, uh, if one can imagine commuting to Singapore. I was commuting to Singapore. Then we were very fortunate that the role in Aparatni, the, the f uh, former Department of Mechanical Engineering, uh, there was a really happenstance. I was in the dean's office uh, talking to Donna Savicki, the uh, assistant dean uh, for the School of Engineering, and we were talking, well, you know, maybe um, someone like Rohan might be interested in this. And Rob and ha Rohan happened to be coming by, and uh, I poked my head out of the office and said, Rohan, how would you like to go to Singapore for three years and head this program? And quite surprising to me, he says, well, let me think about this. And the rest is history. He's now become the director. He's in Singapore for three years to head, head the program. So that was the, the, the SMART program in development. It's now got uh, two other research uh, programs. There's a program in uh, biomechanics that we're doing there, and one that was just approved called uh, Fu Future of Urban Mobility, looking at uh, uh, transportation, uh, urban transportation systems. So that was smart, and uh, as we became more comfortable with uh, Singapore uh, in our interactions with Singapore, and they became more comfortable with us, there was a, a growing appetite, I think, from Singapore for us to do things and a growing willingness for us to do them in the sense of hopefully doing good deeds and providing significant resources for MIT to do these good deeds. Uh, then a couple of years ago, I was I'm visiting with the former Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, Tony Tan is his name, an MIT alum. And uh, I was, I remember this still vividly to this day, I was sitting in his couch in his office, and he said, Tom, uh, probably the most uh, important thing we're going to do in education over the next decade or two is develop a new university. How would MIT like to be involved in this? And we're looking for a, an international uh, partner for this. So I came, for, I fe almost fell out of the, my chair. I said, I fell out of the sofa. I said, there's no way MIT is going to want to do this, right? Why do we want to establish this new university? So I came back and talked to the provost, Raphael Reif, and some others. And surprising to me, there was some interest. You know, this might be a, a great way to do educational experiments, to uh, invest in education, and to do some good deeds for the world. And that led to a set of discussions over time. 
Uh, at one point, they uh, actually early in that, they said we'd also like the founding president of uh, this university to come from the partner university. You know, we were competing for this. So this wasn't. They were just looking at us. They were looking at other universities. And um, the pro the provost asked me if I would lead the negotiations for this. I had no sense that I was going to be the president of this thing because of my personal circumstances. I can't go to Singapore for three years or four years to start this. So I figured I was just doing this to help MIT. Uh, but somewhere along the line, uh, they got it into their heads that I should be the guy. Uh, they were willing to uh, accommodate my personal circumstance in terms of this commuting. I think they were attracted both because they knew me and also we talked before about the importance of the institute professor. So having an institute professor at MIT do this was pretty important to them. Um, so uh, I, I uh, agreed to do this and decided to do it. And we worked out all the details and things. Uh, and uh, then we were chosen to be the partner, you know, the collaborating university for this new uh, program. And as we discussed before, MIT's development is going to be multifaceted and rich, developing curriculum, student exchanges, uh, helping with uh, developing co-curricular activities, technology based, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the evolving Singapore story. Uh, whether it'll grow in any sense in the future, it's not quite clear, but uh, it's become, uh, I think it's fair to say, our deepest intellect international collaboration probably ever, uh, and a very significant collaboration. Well, it, well it's not surprising that, uh, at all that they would ask you to lead this effort mm -hmm. to become president. Your career at MIT has been marked uh, with uh, a series of starting programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked to LFM, SDM, on, on and on. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your uh, expertise at, at, at starting programs like this at MIT? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think one of the nice things about uh, MIT is MIT in general is entrepreneurial. Um, and if I think of myself, I think the last thing uh, anyone would want would be for me to start a company, right? Because I have no facilities uh, and no talent for managing a business, managing finances of our company, meeting payrolls and all this kind of stuff. On the other hand, uh, MIT provides a great opportunity for what you might think of as academic entrepreneurs. And if in some ways I were to characterize myself, uh, other than my educational or research contributions, it would be as an, as an academic entrepreneur. Uh, uh, I get the biggest charge out of starting new programs. And one of the downsides for, for me for being dean, we were able to start UPAP and a few other things, but you're somewhat removed from that as being the dean. You, you sort of handed it off to someone else to go off and do it. Uh, and one of the nice things about stepping down is I could again become an academic entrepreneur, and whether it was LFM or SDM or these other programs. And SMART was one version of that. And the notion of getting SMART up and working and try to make it successful was a, a challenge. Uh, and it also had the uh, opportunity of working with uh, lots of uh, faculty at MIT and the administration to make it work. And putting the puzzle together, like starting up a new company, a uh, new venture, is, uh, there's lots of, for me, lots of psychic rewards in doing that and, and a sense of accomplishment, uh, collective accomplishment for the team. And I view this uh, activity with the Singapore University of Technology and Design the same way. It's um, an opportunity of working with a, a team, a team of folks in Singapore and a team of MIT faculty, many who I've worked with before, but some who I haven't. Uh, and just I just find it uh, enormously exciting, uh, uh, enormously fulfilling to be able to be this kind of uh, academic entrepreneur. And, as I said, MIT is a place that values that. It values new programs. It values this entrepreneurship activity. And it provides an environment that's conducive to it and supportive of it. And uh, so in that sense, uh, SUTD is an evolution for me in terms of a series of these, uh, these opportunities. I, I suspect it may be my last big one like this, but uh, well, one never knows. We'll see. We'll right, see. Sir. I think everyone's looking forward to uh, well, I mean, the benefits of these programs have been enormous to MIT, both mm -hmm. um, from an, uh, an educational point of view, but also from an economic point of view. Yes. And um, so I look forward to uh, sitting down with you again when you return yeah, from, when, from when, your presidency. When we do the 200th. Exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> you may exactly. be here, but I don't think I will be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, not, yeah, my pleasure. My, my pleasure. pleasure.